Right, welcome everybody to Gilligan Rowe's uh, Property and Tax Update in conjunction with uh, KPM Mortgages, Chris Peterson. Uh, welcome, Chris. We have uh, a few guest speakers tonight, and um, I've been trying to hide them, but unfortunately not very well hidden. Uh, our agenda is we've got a market update, um, which I'm going to talk to a few anecdotal bits of information I've got, got from some real estate agents and from some data people. And then we're going to have our our guest speaker, uh, who is uh, a surprise for all of us, uh, because I managed to get him at short notice. I'll introduce him shortly. Then we're going to have Chris Peterson from Chris Peterson Mortgages on a finance update. And then later in the evening, we'll have uh, Anthony Lipscomb, who's a GRA partner on the uh, tax side of things, and give us an update on tax. Those of you that don't know me, I'm a chartered accountant, um, MD here at GRA, and uh, I'm also a property investor and developer. Uh, I used to be full time in tax and legal structure planning for clients. Uh, these days, I'm more active in the property scene. Uh, my colleague Anthony Lipscomb, who's a lawyer and a chartered accountant, uh, runs the tax and legal team here at GRA. He's a tax expert. He's a tax structuring expert. Um, he is commerce and law degrees. He's admitted to the bar and uh, very experienced and a partner here at GRA. So he's going to take us through the tax side of things. And then after, uh, actually just before he does that, we're going to have Chris Peterson from Chris Peterson Mortgages. So he's going to come through and give us a uh, finance update. So it should actually be a really positive and great evening. And uh, I've got a surprise speaker for you. He'll be speaking uh, in about 10 minutes. Uh, so, surprise guest speaker coming. A uh, little bit of background, quite a few of our clients like to track what I get up to. Uh, last couple of years, uh, I've been doing this subdivision in South Canterbury, about 40 kilometres south of Christchurch. That red block on the left uh, is a 8 hectare piece of land that myself and a good friend of mine in Canterbury bought, Peter Montgomery and I bought that. And uh, we turned it into... Uh, subdivision 80 sections and it's down there last week and it was great to see it completely built out you know there's very few sections not built on so I'm, I'm continuing to do that sort of thing and I actually think it's an excellent environment at the moment to go looking for these sorts of developments if you've got the financing capacity uh, because the stuff's you know it's just um, much more discounted than it was prior to the to the last boom uh, a lot of land is being sold off. People can't fund it. So if you can do this sort of thing, it's obviously a excellent thing to do, very profitable um, business to be in. Uh, another thing that I'm, I'm enjoying at the moment is building houses in Auckland, uh, these sorts of things uh, in Mount Roskill. You can see uh, that's four units. Uh, Slash is a partner here at GRA, and I built those four. And you might think that develop to sell is tough in this market, but actually if you develop to hold, it's much easier to get funding for that. So we built those to hold and uh, very easy to get funding and rented beautifully to social housing, uh, getting a, a net yield. Mm, it's over $1,000 a week we're getting out of social housing and they cost us 700000 each to build 130 metre houses. They revalued at a million dollars. So capital gain, uh, no tax to pay as long as we keep them. And, uh, you know, no GST, no income tax, no agents fees, making 30% on the way in and, uh, you know, excellent yield. So I'll do that all day long if I can for my portfolio, brand new housing, um, new builds, funding and um, historically tax advantages too. So, you know, I think it's an excellent thing to be in. And what I've found is uh, if you go out to the marketplace at the moment, a lot of developers don't have the capacity to, to get funding and they're dropping their consented property. So this is a consented property that I've bought with Selesh and a, another a business partner in a, in a syndicate that we're running. Uh, not the most beautiful houses, I must say. In fact, possibly the most ugly houses I've ever seen. <laughs> Very ugly. But actually uh, quite profitable because we're targeting a price point and, uh, you know, we're... Uh, we've got a 25% GP on these, just little walk-ups, parking at the back, out in Tiana 2. And uh, they're three-bedroom units. Um, 
and garages downstairs and living rooms uh, downstairs. And the thing I like the most about this is we could buy this for, I think we paid 1.25 for it, uh, fully consented. Building consent, resource consent, completely consented. Um, and that would have been in the twos uh, a couple of years ago, 2.3, something like that, 2.5. So it was a you know shovel-ready project to get into. So we we bought it and we're, we're doing it. Um, Woolfield Road, uh, so we actually got two of them. We've got um, Sylvan Road in Te Aratu, and 68 Woolfield Road is the second one we're doing uh, in in um, Papatoi. Uh, that's a slightly better looking development. So we're just buying these, consented, good to go, and getting into them. And it, they're at least a million dollars off what they, what they were uh, during the boom. And so while the old number is not making sense, the new number is making sense. And you, you don't have to necessarily build to sell, you can build to hold. So we're getting into it. So no, this is another uh, more dense project that I'm, I'm consenting at the moment. It's uh, walk-up units in Glen Innes, 29 units. It's a bigger project. And actually, this isn't working. So I want to give you an example of something that isn't working in this market. Uh, even though they're three level and we are making money, um, you know, right now, units are not valuing in Auckland. So I'm consenting it. I'll get it consented. And I'm leaving the two houses that are currently on it, which we'll knock down. And I'll just park it up. And I know that in two or three years' time, I'm, you know, when I say I know, <laughs> um, my opinion is that Auckland will recover. This sort of stuff, I'll get seventy-five thousand dollars a unit more at least. Based, we're at the bottom of the market now, I think, and so you get twenty-nine times seventy-five thousand, possibly more. Suddenly, what is a average yield? Um, maybe fifteen percent will jump up to thirty percent in two or three years' time. So this this is the sort of stuff that uh, we're seeing our clients do, buying assets well, consenting them, sitting on them, waiting for better times. It's it's good good use of your good use of your your money and your time in the down market. So for me, uh, I I do like to build and hold because no GST, no income tax. It, it's easier to bank, as I said. Um, if you develop it to sell. You've got to pay tax on the whole lot, and it's hard to fund at the moment. So have a think about that. Uh, and right around the country, there is better priced land, and I'm seeing fully considered developments where the vendor can't sit on it because of interest rates. So there's opportunities, opportunities to pick up consented developments at the moment. Um, I am building affordable housing because with interest rates high, that's where the demand is. So I think it's a, a good price point to be targeting as affordable as possible because that market is still there. And I'm going to read you some feedback from agents that support that in the moment. Um, don't build too big. The market's not going to pay for the extra space. It's a rookie mistake. I see developers doing it. They, they develop and consent generous 100-metre houses when the market's building and selling 80-metre houses. And it turns out that you get the same price for a 100-metre two-bedroom unit as you do for an 80 so don't don't um, don't build too much. Uh, and you know, if for me, um, I don't have time to go and supervise the subdivision, and I don't have the skill set. So another thing I encourage my clients to look at is JVs, find competent builders and project managers that can run these projects. <clears throat> Combine your skill or your what you bring to the party, which might be capital um, and banking ability, and get a lot more done. So, you know, we're fully functioning in the down market despite the recessionary environment because we're taking the, the blend of skills and capital and mixing them all together. So I'm very positive with what, what's going on uh, in my portfolio despite actually looking at the distress thing. goodness, this is a, a rough environment. Um, of course, we've still got lots of social housing going on in our portfolios here at GRA. We were doing social housing before there was a tax incentive for it, we did it because we thought it was good business. We got 100% occupancy, no management fee, lower uh, maintenance costs, a uh, bit tricky with insurance, but it's solvable. Uh, but, you know, when we build to hold, that, that's the direction we're going. Um, we, we think it's an excellent, excellent, uh, excellent investment. So tonight is not about how to 
how to develop property tonight is uh, a bit of an update. And uh, if you're wondering on what you can do in this environment, maybe some of that stuff I've just discussed is uh, an, an option for you or, or your colleagues. Um, I was chatting to John Butt in Wellington. He's an investor in Wellington. He gave me some good slides and, and uh, gave me a bit of feedback. He's a, a um, data guy and he's a old school investor, 40 years in the game and somebody I respect. And uh, what he what he produced last week was this interesting graph showing uh, sales prices are balancing from mid-2023 forwards. And it's his opinion that we've bounced and hit the bottom. Uh, I would be interested in what the what the group online thinks it's going to do, but uh, he's firmly of the view that um, his index is showing that we are bouncing. And he sees a very high correlation to household incomes, um, which, which he was discussing with me. He said that uh, he's seeing a 50% increase in the number of rental properties listed in the last two months. And he said that there's a large number of accidental landlords being created, people downshifting out of Auckland, uh, baby boomers going into retirement villages, people who can't get their price, so they rent their property out, uh, either because they've purchased the next property or uh, they can't afford their house and they can't sell it. So they move out and rent it and then go and rent something cheaper. So but anecdotally, that was, that was something he was saying, and, and it really is echoing what? The real estate agents who are talking to me are saying, and what we're seeing throughout throughout New Zealand in our travels and our discussions with clients. Um, he also noted to me that the affordability of housing is really improving. So that while there's a lot of bad news and adverse news, and it's tempting to look out into the abyss at the moment and be negative, if you actually look, uh, incomes have been going up and house prices have fallen on, on average twenty percent, so or more right across the country. So we, we got a double boom, we're having a double bust, uh, as I call it, and house prices are down 20% uh, or more across the country. And against that, you've had incomes rising. So New Zealand household income growth rates have been phenomenally high <clears throat> in the last three years. And so John, John thinks that's going to slow down. I'll, I'll be interested in, in, in what our next guest speaker says about this. Uh, but the point is when you've got incomes rising rapidly and you've and these are household incomes uh, and you've got house prices falling, the previous slide showing affordability by region rapidly increasing with, for example, Auckland, the wider Auckland area, going from a um, multiple of household income to average homes of uh, over 12 to now sub uh sub 10. So the affordability is coming back in. Um, and, you know, long may long may that follow as we see um, household incomes continue to rise and particularly interest rates uh, soften. But, you know, don't discount the impact of this. So Auckland was terribly unaffordable. It's now becoming uh, much more affordable. And so is the rest of the country with incomes going up. So <clears throat> I do what I like to do and go and talk to real estate agents around the country. Just ring up random agents that I know. Uh, I like this guy, Calvin. He's a Barfoot's agent out west, and he uh, always says it, how, say, says it how it is. So I said, Calvin, what's going on? He said to me that uh, in Auckland at the moment, and particularly West Auckland, there is a lot of stock um, with terraced houses and high-density houses, walk-ups, he said there's next to no buyers for them. Uh, he said Barfoot's have 5,300 houses on the market in Auckland at the moment. Normally they have about 4,200. They have very few attendees to townhouses. He said what is much better, uh, and, and he said is houses with freestanding um, or, or separate, um, separate titles with the house um, away from the other terraces, so traditional housing, like old school freestanding houses from the 70s or 80s uh, or new new builds that are freestanding. He said that's where the interest in the market is at the moment. Um, he said uh, on townhouses, all standalone houses, everybody's wanting at least 900,000 for them. That's the average vendor expectation. He said the typical purchasers are in the high sevens. 
And as soon as the purchasers agree to read the market, things sell very quickly. You see the gaps, typically 150,000 uh, freestanding or terraced houses, it's typically 150,000 um, between vendor and purchaser. He said that there's lots of people wanting to buy, they can't get finance. He said, he said there's lots of offers subject to the sale of other properties. Um, he said affordability and interest rates are, are the main concern he has. He says he's seeing lots of bargain hunters. Um, he said they're the aggressive bargain hunters that you expect to see at the bottom of the cycle. Um, he said he's not seeing uh, you know, the, the long-term investors back in yet. He said he's, he's seeing the, the aggressive investors looking for big discounts. Uh, he said he's seeing a few first-time buyers bargain hunting. Um, he said walk-up units with parks, two bedrooms um, on top, open plan living downstairs. He said uh, one sold last year at 780, this year it resold at 670. He said another sold last year at 870, uh, this year they can't get 730. So this is that point where you say, oh, Matthew just told us he's building those. Has Matthew cocked that up? <laughs> and to that, I reply and say, well, it would it would be a mistake if I paid 2.3 million for the land, but I paid 1.3. So if you've, you know, if you're buying in at the reduced price, then you can afford to sell at these reduced prices. So we've got 700,000 as our mean values uh, and our feasibilities and our, our incomes are over 20%. Um, and, that, you know, so... So if you buy it in this market, you can actually deliver the stock at these price points. So there's lots of developers uh, who he is talking to that are now turning to building uh, standalone houses because they can't sell these these other houses and make a profit on them. Mm. So that was uh, interesting chat, and I think that's on point. Uh, I rang Megan Jaffe at Ray White and Rima Wera. She's uh, top end. And so she sells a lot of very high-end houses. And she said it's a buyer's market. She said uh, if, the mar if the vendor drops 20%, it sells. Uh, she said there's lots of buyers in Remuera um, at fair market value. Uh, she says it's actually business as usual over there. They say they don't normally see much stock at this time of year in Remuera, but she says with interest rates biting, They've got a phenomenal amount of stock, and it's almost like it's spring, but it's going into winter. So she's amazed at how much stock is coming on. Uh, she said that she thinks that Brightline could be a factor because there are a lot of investors, and they're seeing the 1 July date coming through. And she thinks that maybe uh, some of the investors are trying to get ahead of the curve there and jumping out because they can with the reduced Brightline period, which was an astute comment. She said that, under 1.4 million in the wider Remuera area, they had far too much stock, um, echoing Calvin's comments. Um, she said lots of units of walk-ups, so this is the Auckland Unitary Plan that's really front of the market with it. She listed 20, 20 today alone. Uh, she says investors are dumping stock. They can't afford to hold them at these interest rates. She says investors just want fair value. They don't need to get top dollar. Uh, they've got plenty of equity, most of them, and they'll just drop them at, at, at whatever the market value is. So she says, much better buying around, but the buyers aren't there yet with interest rates being held so high. Uh, she says investors and homeowners are tending, tending to prefer assets without body corporates, so they'll, they'll certainly buy assets if they can that, that are not units with, with large body corporate overheads. She says that uh, stock sales in Ringawera are down 40%, but uh, that's 40% on the post-pandemic boom numbers. And she said that they were artificially high, so it should be ignored. She thinks that it's business as usual at the moment. She says stock between 5 to 10 million in Ringawera is stuck. Uh, above 10 million is, is still hot, and sub 5 million is still moving. So that's the top end of New Zealand real estate. Uh, interesting. <clears throat> and for a bit of variety, um, and you, you notice I'm, I'm cherry picking people in areas that I invest in, which is you know, East Auckland, I own property, West Auckland, I own property, and now Canterbury, uh, Chris Jones, I, I own property down there. Um, Chris Jones from Bailey's in Canterbury says that uh, for the most part, Canterbury is alive and well and doing very well. He says that this year there's been five sales above 7 million. 
Uh, last year, the highest sale achieved in Canterbury was $5 million. This year, there's been five above seven already. He said out-of-towners are coming down there. He thinks maybe they're downshifting out of Auckland. He says locals are more confident this year than last year. So the, the market remains solid in Canterbury. He said the number of cash buyers has dropped away. The majority of houses are passing in, but sell after auction, 80% within two weeks after auction, 30% under the hammer. So he said they just need a bit of time to get their banking and their on sales sorted out. He said the average um, buyer last year and the year before was looking to build. This year, they're looking for finished houses. That's a change. He said group housing builders are actually doing much better this year. They're selling stock. He said sections in the outer areas of Canterbury are, are doing really well. He gave me some price points, but that's my research. He said what is not hot is inner city uh, attached housing. He said it's challenging. Uh, it's very slow to sell. He said that there's no yield on it. Uh, because with, with current interest rates where they are. So he said there's a combination of too much stock and no yield, and banks being cautious on that type of stock, it's difficult. Um, he said any property that requires renovation or as-is type houses down there, I've done a lot of those. He said they're dead because uh, the banking on them is tough when renovations are quite high. Renovation costs are quite high in Canterbury. And he said he's not seeing any upsizing, which was a trend in the last few years. He said everybody's just sitting where they are. They don't want any more debt with, with interest rates so high. So he said what is hot there is lower end, affordable housing, freestanding houses, and first homes of 750 or less, echoing what uh, Calvin said and in the upper echelon on what Megan's saying. <clears throat> he, he did say, and I liked it, he said, name me a nurse, a fireman, a policeman, a teacher, uh, that is not thinking of leaving New Zealand and going to Australia. He said, with incomes being double over there and the tough environment we're in, not being helped by uh, our Reserve Bank governor, who he has no love for, um, he said, uh, it's tough times in New Zealand and we're seeing outflows of, and, and brain drain. Um, and he said he's seeing lots of accidental property investors. They can't sell their original house. They rented out and... Uh, buy the next one or downshift whatever they're doing so quite quite useful um comments there and i think quite on point so i have a surprise surprise guest for you tonight uh many of you will know it's tony alexander he's an economist the ex bnz chief economist and he's been one of our guests uh here on our gra webinars many times uh and someone that i have great respect for and i'm sure you guys all have great respect for him as well. So, uh, Tony, welcome. Rightio. Look, thanks very much for that, uh, uh, Matt. Uh, yeah, good rundown. I get a lot of anecdotal evidence also coming through from my uh, uh, monthly surveys, especially from the uh, real estate agents. And I sent out the results for my recent um, latest survey just uh, yesterday uh, morning, and I might run through some of those uh, later on. But um, I'm, I'm not really going to focus on sort of where the market is at. I think you've covered that uh, really, really well. What I'm spending most of my time these days doing is trying to give some people uh, understanding about what is going on in the economy broadly, why it is that the housing market, which you know had a good year by and large last year, which is what I expected, uh, expected to happen, but this year is not what I expected. There's extra weakness out, out there, and I, I like having a look at uh, why that has turned out to be the case. So that's where I'm going to concentrate, uh, uh, basically. Well, I, might so, just, I might just shut up and leave you to it, then I'll have a word to you at the end. So yeah, okay, right here. Yeah. So here we go. Okay, so last year we saw the real estate market picking up, good seasonally adjusted jump in sales around the middle of the year. And on average in the five month period from July last year through to November, house prices rose nationwide on average using the REINZ's house price index, 0.9% uh, a month. So prices were rising, it was all looking fairly good. But in the five months uh, since December and including December of last year, prices on average have fallen about 0.2, 0.3% a month um, or so, and uh, sales have flattened out. Now, the view I'd had for the past two years uh, plus had been that uh, with the economy still largely being okay and the passage of time with the first home buyers jumping in in the first half of uh, last year, you know, we would see a lot of catch-up buying going on. My blind spot 
was I did not think to myself, oh, hang on, if there's catch-up buying uh, by people, frustrated buyers, I wonder if there's going to be catch-up selling as well. And uh, yeah, the evidence is that once people saw the market was picking up, um, they decided to jump in their boots and all. And so while we had the nationwide stock of listings at the end of 2022 at about uh, 28,000 or so, uh, and that fell through to July last year, about 24,000, now it's about 26% uh, higher at about 31,000 or so. And that's a combination of some easing off in the buyers that I'll address uh, shortly, but also in January and February, a big seasonally adjusted jump in the number of fresh listings coming forward. People had a wee rest going into uh, Christmas there, uh, after the election, all that kerfuffle, etc., and then decided uh, they'd try and take advantage of strength in the market and a lot of property coming on the market over in uh, January and February um, this year. So now in terms of what's been happening in the economy, sort of contributing to this as well, what we're seeing through 2024 is largely what I expected to be the case of this is a weeding out year. This is when we've had weakness in the economy for a couple of years. We've got a lot of businesses that have had sufficient cash reserves, but now those cash reserves are running out. And so there's a lot of rationalization, liquidations, et cetera, are going on. They're concentrated, as is the same case in Australia, in the retailing sector, the hospitality sector, and the residential construction sector. But across all sectors in the economy, there are quite a few chickens coming home um, to roost. And that's what I've been addressing in recent months in my columns and commentary. And I'm going to have a wee run through here of some of the factors uh, which are in play. Um, a simple one, just to get out of the way, would be the IRD. After being all uh, uh, sitting around the campfire singing uh, Kumbaya there uh, for a, a couple of years with the uh, uh, pandemic, now that we have the IRD reminding people that they are there to collect taxes, you have to pass on your PAYE, KiwiSaver uh, you've got from the, uh, the staff, etc., the GST. And for many businesses, that is the trigger to, to liquidate or have to have a serious look at staff numbers, um, etc. Also, the evidence out of Australia and the United States is that households have used up all of their pandemic savings. About $250 billion worth of extra savings in Australia were built up, uh, about $1.7 trillion, uh, $2.1 trillion in the United States. And the research over in those two countries shows it's all been used up. I can only assume in the absence of such research in New Zealand, we, we've probably reached the same point um, as well, where those extra savings built up by both the business sector and the household sector have probably been used up. So again, that's a, a source of cash flow pressure um, on businesses out there. Now, in the middle of last year, net jobs growth in New Zealand stopped. We'd had great jobs growth for a while, but since about the middle of last year, new jobs were being uh, matched by job losses elsewhere, essentially no grow, uh, jobs growth in New Zealand for the past three quarters or so. Now that's taken a while to feed through to people's perceptions of job security. But this is one of the reasons I love the survey I do of real estate agents there, because there's, there's a, a question there. I ask the agents, uh, what is it that the buyers are concerned about? And so I can see over time the change in concerns of the number of listings, not enough listings, and now hardly anybody is concerned about a, a shortage of listings, access to credit interest rates, um, et cetera, uh, but also, of course, uh, jobs, employment, work hours, uh, income availability, et cetera. On average, over the past four years, 16% uh, of agents have, on average, said, yeah, people are worried about their jobs. Earlier this year, that was only 14%. Now it's 55%. From about February, March or so, we saw a big surge in job insecurity in New Zealand. Now, this I think is quite significant for the first home buyers. For the people, uh, middle-aged people and, and the older people, they've seen job losses before, they've seen unemployment and probably think to themselves, well, you know, the current 4.3% unemployment rate, oh, that was considered a boom back in the old days. And even the forecast of five or even 5.5% unemployment rate Meh. But for the younger cohort of people out there, these first home buyers, they haven't seen an environment before where they can see job employment worries out there, 
but no one is there to help them. Previously, the Reserve Bank has been slashing interest rates. The government has been throwing extra money into the economy. Now, there's no one there to help them. And so that is a wee bit of a shock to the first home buyers out there. And I can see that coming through again when I ask the agents about, are you seeing more or fewer uh, first home buyers out there? On average, four years, I'd have a net 15% of the agents saying, eh, we've got more first home buyers. Earlier this year, it was a plus 55%, so really strong. Now it's only plus 5%. So those young buyers backing away from the market. I also asked them about the, the investors. On average, four years, I've had a net 20% of agents saying, oh, there's fewer investors. Earlier this year, a net 24% of the agents said there's more investors. There were some investor buyers out there. Now it's back to the average, about minus 24% um, or so. So some of the investors who ran for the hills, from March 23 of 2021, uh, came out a bit, poked their noses out, and the, now they've edged back into the hills, even with the tax changes, et cetera, um, coming along. There's a few other things, fiscal pol policy reality check, which is going on um, out there uh, as well. Now, I've mentioned the younger age group. There's something new for them, job and security. Middle age group, mortgages, owner occupiers, not doing too much. It's been that way for maybe a couple of years. Now, the older age group, there's something interesting, I think, happening there as well. Um, they've seen it all before. They've generally kept quiet over the past two years or so because they're doing OK. Investment properties, uh, they're worth so much more than they paid for them many, many year years ago. Uh, they've handled uh, high inflation in the past. Again, meh, not now. Now, the insurance premiums, as we all know, have gone through the roof the past year, 25 to 30 percent. And so that's hitting the house they live in and their investment property and there's nothing you can do about it. And also the rates, the local authority rates rising 18, 24% um, or so. Again, your own property, your investment property, and the council saying, oh, and we're going to do this for each of the next three, five, seven, or whatever years um, as well. Now, that is hitting in, I think, to the psyche and the cash flow projections of the older age group. And so that's another new development this year. So two new negative things for the younger groups, job insecurity is rising. And for the older group, a cost of living shock that they haven't really had to worry necessarily about much before. And all of that sits sort of as extra negatives into the overarching monetary policy lagged impact. Now, I think this is a very key thing here and helps explain why I figured for this year, the economy was not really going to be all that flash it was going to be a weeding out. It takes 18 to 24 months for a monetary policy change to have its big impact on getting inflation down in the economy. Now, if you're quick off the mark, you'll remember, so the first monetary policy tightening, the OCR, the official cash rate, went up in October uh, 2021. We are 34 months down the line from that. So, hey, doesn't that mean interest rates should be coming down by now? Not necessarily. When monetary policy started to get tightened. Nobody gave a damn. It was from the cash rate at 0.25%. The first three increases were 0.25%. Half a percent increases didn't start until April 2022, but we were only starting from a 1% cash rate. In the GFC, the low was 2.5%. So again, meh, nobody really cared all that much. But in November of 2022, the Reserve Bank and the rest of us, we'd all seen the higher than expected inflation number for the year to September 2022. And the Reserve Bank got its opportunity to react to that in November 2022 with their monetary policy statement. And that's when monetary policy really hit its strides with a 0.75% increase in the official cash rate, which is a rare thing. And the Reserve Bank saying, we're going to have a recession. And so that to me is when monetary policy really was, was aggressively tightened in New Zealand. We are now in June 2024, 19, one nine months down the track from that happening. Only now are we into the 18, 24 month period when monetary policy is going to have its greatest impact on suppressing inflation. And what that means is that this is the period when the Reserve Bank has the least incentive to smile and say, this is going okay. Uh, we're going to ease fairly soon. Because after all this pain so, so far, to ease up now and give a positive uh, signal would mean that all of this previous time period was absolutely wasted. This is when they get their best payoff and their best bang for the buck. Now, 
what will they be looking for to really be convinced, boy, this is really hoeing in here, this 18, 24 month uh, period, and we are going to be able to probably cut interest rates before mid 25, which is what they stuck with and sort of pushed out a little bit, sort of, uh, in their most recent monetary policy statement. Uh, I think what they'll be concentrating on will be the price setting behavior by businesses. And this is where I want you to think about monetary policy as sort of four boxes or whatever shape you choose. The first box over here is interest rates go up. The last box is inflation goes down. Uh, that's obvious. Everybody knows it. The second box in here is interest rates go up. Consumer spending gets crunched. We all know they want consumer spending down because that gets inflation down in the fourth box. But as consumer spending is weakening and all the data shows it's fallen away quite a bit, we consumers don't set the price of a single item of the 649 that make up the consumer's price index. That's all in the third box, the price setting behavior by businesses. That is the target of the Reserve Bank, the price setting behavior of businesses. And what they want is this, that the businesses, when they right now are having their quarterly, half yearly, annual, let's call it a price pricing committee meeting, and somebody's saying, the accountant is saying, our costs have just gone up by 10%, and so we need to raise our prices by 10%. Oh, well, yeah, we need to raise our prices 10%. What the Reserve Bank is looking for is this. The marketing manager will jump up and say, we can't do that. We're already losing customers because times are tough or perceived to be tough out there by young people, job and security, older people, ranks and insurance, et cetera. If we raise prices, uh, we, we're hardly going to sell anything. We've already got unsold inventory building up. We cannot pass on the cost increases. We are going to have to look at other things. And that's what's now starting to happen. One of my five monthly surveys uh, is of businesses. And I ask them, are you planning to increase your prices? over the next uh, 12 months. So it's just a rough uh, gauge. But in the most recent survey of about three weeks ago, I had a net 12% of businesses saying not planning to increase their prices. The previous uh, results for the past year were all in, in positive territory. Now, the Reserve Bank might note that, but they're not going to do anything on that basis. What they'll look at will be the likes of the ANZ Business Outlook Price Expectations Measure, uh, which has been running for decades. During the period from 1992 through to recently, when inflation in New Zealand averaged about 2.3% a year, a net 25% of businesses in the ANZ's monthly business outlook survey would say, I'm going to jack my prices up in the next 12 months. So that's what the Reserve Bank wants to see. The net proportion of businesses saying going to raise prices are uh, getting to 25%. Now, it was stuck around 50, a net 50% 50 in this measure from May last year up until, I guess, the most recent survey of about a month ago. And then it finally fell after going a net 45%, 47%, most recently 42%. So the Reserve Bank will look at that and go, monetary policy is working. We, we, we're going to get towards the 2%. We're going to get away from the 4% inflation, but they're not there yet. They're going to be looking for this to really strongly go a lot lower. And I do think that's still going to take some time to come through. So look, we are in the, um, the, the sort of worst period of the lagged effect of monetary policy tightening. And it's sort of a, a, a bit of bad luck for the economy out there that it's come at the same time as we've got the IRD catching up on uh, tax obligations, the pandemic savings, um, which have run out, and some of the other stuff, which are the cost of living shock for the older folk and well, people generally with the rates uh, and insurance. What does that lead me to say on interest rates? Well, it leads me to say pretty much what Treasury was saying in their budget as well. I think it's sort of just me and Treasury out there with this uh, view. The bank economists are still looking at February or May uh, for the first cut. I see the ANZ have just come back into February for the first OCR cut. I think it's going to come in November and it could be a relatively rapid series of interest rate cuts because I think the economy is going to be weaker than the Reserve Bank was expecting this year and they will be able to bring their monetary policy easing back in in time. But they're not going to give the slightest hint of it for a long period of time because we're in that 18 to 24 month period. It would be absolutely the worst thing they could do uh, at the moment. What does that mean 
it means you continue to listen to the stuff like uh, Matt was saying there in regards to the general investor is not out there. The, the real estate agent from uh, West Auckland saying the general investor is not out there. This is when you need to give greater thought to where are the, I guess, the pockets of strength, uh, look at the population growth, et cetera, look really at what works, what doesn't work. And I've also had the feedback about there's, there's no shortage of the, the skilled, longer term, hey, multi-generational investors know these periods come along and they're making their good purchases not just willy-nilly all over the show, but doing these good purchases from what will be many distressed um, sellers out there. And I think this is just where I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with reference to what I said at a series of talks three years ago. So what's that? It was uh, from February through to about May of 2021, when I spoke with registered master builders uh, meetings, uh, bottom half of the South Island. And I said to the builders there, you're going gangbusters. Everybody talks about a shortage of property around the country. Be very careful. You all know that housing moves in uh, cycles. I've seen shockers over my lifetime. And what's happening is now there are many inexperienced, undercapitalized, over-optimistic people going into the broadly defined house building sector. Maybe they're developers doing subdivisions, architects or, or whatever. There's going to be a weeding out. The weeding out started last year. I think that weeding out process now goes on for longer than I was thinking six months ago because of this extra weakness in the economy now and because what was my blind, blind spot? All these extra vendors stepping forward from sort of well, very late last year, actually, to take advantage. Uh, meaning, why do I need, if I'm a buyer, to look at getting something built when I've got 31,000 listings to, to, to go through? The highest number since 2015. And so that's where I see the market at the moment. It is still going to be a pretty rough period for the rest of this year. Interest rates falling. I think there's a 1% decline between about November this year and towards the middle of next year. That will then set the scene for the market to improve within an environment of construction falling away. The One, one thing, that, uh, Matt, you, you mentioned also when we were chatting earlier on today, um, the immigration is going to fall, uh, fall away with the rule changes by the government. And these things move in cycles as well. Um, it'll be interesting to keep an eye on that one. But my final comment will be, if immigration was really the big driver of the housing market in the short term, with the net migration gain still of 111,000 in the past year, well, house prices will be rising through, through the roof. Uh, in the short term, it's not a key driver, especially with the nature of the people that have been coming in um, and, into New Zealand uh, over the past year or so. So I'll stop there, I guess, in the interest of time, Matt. And... Um, I see what happens. I'd make a comment about immigration too. That the the it's low wage earners that the uh, new settings are targeting, and uh, those people don't tend to have PRs, so they can't buy houses. So they're not affecting demand for for purchasing. They're not, you know, but they are affecting rents. Yeah, and and I'm getting feedback. Uh, I spoke to David Faulkner from Property Brokers. They're one of the largest, uh, I think they are, Chris, the largest in the country, aren't they, for rental? And he said that he's, for the first time in his, I'm not going to say his career, but a very long time, uh, he's seeing an overhang of rental stock in the market. Uh, and I'm hearing that in Auckland very much so, that right now rents are starting to decline and it's taking longer to rent houses. So those migrants, they might not be buying houses, but they're renting houses and they're disappearing and it's being felt. Yep. Can I throw something else in here? Uh, there's a monthly uh, survey I do also of existing residential property investors, and this is starting to show something interesting. What I've tended to have was something like 60, 62 percent of the um, uh, investors saying, I'm going to hold my property at least 10 years or never sell. That's been trending down, and I think the last result was about 50% or so saying that. And I think this older age group I'm talking about is going, yeah, you know, I think the time maybe is right to realise the value of our asset. And what I find interesting there is people think in terms of, all oh, the investors, why would you sell now when you bought three years ago or whatever? Well, hang on, God knows what time in the past these existing investors bought. And even if they, you know, they discount 20% to get the sale, as one of the agents was saying there, it's still well above what they bought it at at a year ago, uh, years and years ago. So I'll just put that dynamic in there. Yeah, it's twenty percent down, isn't it? Do you think we're seeing wage price spirals again? Is that what we're seeing a bit of that? 
No, no, no. Wage price spiral. I think it was a legitimate concern when in those business pricing meetings, oh, our costs have gone up 10%, minimum wage, Matariki, all these other sort of things in there. Ah, let's wake the prices up on the on the other side. That was that that's a key thing the Reserve Bank uh, uh had has to be fighting. Uh the Reserve Bank had overstimulated the economy, inflation at 7.3%, house prices up 46%, unemployment rate 3.2%, definitely overstimulated. And and a wage price cycle uh, uh situation was to developing. Um, but I, I don't think so now. Wages growth is definitely slowing down. We could see that in the latest quarterly employment survey numbers of a number of weeks ago uh, now. And the weaker jobs growth, the rising job insecurity, the labour market dynamic has actually changed quite a bit, I'd, I'd suggest out there. Can I ask a quick question there, um, Tony? So fairly interesting on your newsletter, probably a couple of years ago, you were very much talking about if you're a salaried worker, time to give your boss a nudge in and get a pay increase. Obviously, what you're saying now is probably the complete opposite market in, re in regards to job insecurity. People aren't going to be pushing for an increase. They're happy to hang on to their existing job. Um, looking at the non-tradables, inflation, it seems to be very, very much driven by like rates increases, insurance hikes, stuff like that. Um, that's fine in regards to councils, but kind of the every, everyday kind of Joe or business owner, that's got nothing to do with it. I mean, how much does the Reserve Bank look through those things and understand that probably small, medium businesses are actually starting to behave? Small, medium, oh, oh, right, in that uh, that third box there that they are. Yeah, but they actually are staying, but they are changing their, their, their spending behaviour. Yep. You know, in, you know, incomes aren't going up, people's spending behaviours, because if you go out to a restaurant at the moment, you know, the hospital is dead, retail is getting slammed, all this type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People aren't yeah. upsizing, they're, they're, stuck, they're staying still. Chris cancelled his new Range Rover last month. <laughs> That's devastated. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm taking advantage with some some kitchen renovations are, are being done. Okay, this is where it's, uh, oh, that's a bit of bad luck, isn't it? That we've got now this sort of generational catch up by the councils on what they should have been doing the past God knows how many decades on the water maintenance and, and the pipe works. And now it's coming along at this stage. My feedback on the insurance side is that New Zealand premiums have gone up so much. Uh, the insurance companies overseas are looking at New Zealand and go, well, actually, uh, there might be some good yields there. So maybe we're going to see quite a slowdown in uh, insurance premium increases, but it's not going to happen on the on the rates. Now, the Reserve Bank can't ignore that. It will tend to add a bit extra to the inflation rate, as will the lower rate of growth in New Zealand's productivity. That's what the one key thing in the budget was all about as well. Uh, as well, So the natural rate of inflation in New Zealand, it's, it's higher than it has been maybe for the past uh, three decades, unfor unfortunately. And that leads me to say, say this, when interest rates fall, not a single person out there should be taking a strong view on how much the ultimate decline will be from where we are now to where and whenever the bottom of the cycle would be. We have not got the foggiest idea if we are talking about a one and a half or a three or a 3.25% decline in the official cash rate. I think in the budget, uh, Treasury were well too optimistic in picking the cash rate to go down to 2.5% while the economy is growing about 2.5% as well um, or so. And I think maybe there's a 2% decline or something like that, it could be. That is just pure guesswork um, at this stage. I, I just thought I'd throw that one in there. Can you explain tradables? Because that's the thing that, that everyone's talking about. Uh... Non-tradables. Yep. Yeah. Tradables. So of the 649 items in the consumer's price index uh, basket, about 40% uh, of them or so, the prices are heavily influenced by developments overseas because they're either imported from overseas well, yeah, most of them are imported from overseas, quite frankly. You know, think about the stuff you, you buy down uh, in your shops in New Zealand. A lot of it's made overseas. So about 40% of those prices are determined by developments overseas. Now, overseas, inflation is slowing down um, um, quite well. And so inflation is dropping away for the tradables. The non-tradables is the domestic stuff. And that's what is proving quite difficult for the Reserve Bank. It's not just your local authorities and the insurance. It's uh, basically the cost of uh, maintaining your, your motor vehicle uh, uh, out there. Um, it's the food, uh, a lot of the food, uh, the clothing items, a lot of those, even though some of those, are, many of those are imported from overseas. Uh, the rents, the uh, house construction related costs, a lot of those in there uh, as well. Electricity, of course, uh, is is in there. So yeah, 40% or so comes from overseas. That's helpful at the moment, but that 60% and especially that utilities, et cetera, element of that is still problematic for the Reserve Bank. Again, it's a reason why they will drag this out as long as possible before they go, it's looking okay. There's, there's a bit of commentary around that Nicola Willis is running um, loose fiscal policy. 
and she's not being tight enough. Have you heard that? The, the 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 fiscal impulse coming through there's a still a small positive for this year but then it goes into the negative te territory so there is a tightening of fiscal policy underway there has to be after six years when basically the spigots were let loose and debt level went through the through through the roof there uh, for no benefit to our society unfortunately as far as far as I yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but this is not fiscal austerity. Much as these public servants may think of, uh, think it is, well, hey, welcome to the real world. Uh, public servant numbers went up about 18,000, 18,000 in six years. So if we're dropping 4,000, eh, that's really not too much um, at all. It's Should relevant to Wellington City, but there you go. Should we do some polling? Should we find out what the group thinks? The group's <laughs> normally pretty smart. So here's a poll. Um what will property values do in New Zealand over the next 12 months? I can't vote. Never mind. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tony. Yeah, it's all right. Hey, whatever view I could give, I could easily give you a different view tomorrow because it's like every night we yeah. receive new information. Yeah. Right. It's in poll and share the results. So... There's a few optimists, 17% of you, 39 of you think we're going to go up in the next 12 months. Um, 60, two thirds of you think it's going to stay flat and 17% uh, of you think it's going to go down. What do you think, Tony? Yeah, I was in the stay flat uh, territory. So that's a net 0%, 17 minus the 17. That's how, how we work these things out. That's where I'd have been. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's pretty good, actually. Um, I, would, I would have been in the middle. Hard to call, isn't it? Um, you know, and then your interest rate prediction's pretty... Um, let's have a look at the, what the group thinks. When do you guys think we're going to get a interest rate reduction? They're all just going to take your opinion, I think. Yeah, well, it's... it's, it's I should it's have launched this earlier. Yeah, do it earlier. While they're doing that, um, do you think Adrian Orr's doing a good job? Adrian Orr and the Reserve Chris Bank... Chris loves him. Chris yeah, loves yeah, him. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves the Reserve Bank governor uh, out there. Um, the Reserve Bank did not do a good job, in my opinion, uh, over 2021 into 2022. 2020, I'm giving them near 100%. They reacted, I think, appropriately to the pandemic, slashing interest rates, printing money, lines of credit for the banks, because we had to fight a Great Depression deflationary scenario. Their mistake was not recognising what we economists were seeing, the economy picking up quite well late 2020 and 2021. And they should have said, look, we're going to break our promise on this line of credit to the banks, et cetera, the printing money. And they should have been pulling in earlier and more aggressively in 2021. They weren't as bad as the likes of Reserve Bank of Australia, which took even longer. But 2020, uh, full credit, good. But after that, not so flash. How high is the risk? Um, I suppose I look at that. In my opinion, they went too low for too long. Yeah. And, and and they, you know, if you go back to 2020, they were talking about like a negative OCR. Um, you look at some of the initiatives they bought in, um, you know, et cetera. They, they went far too, far too aggressive. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Adrian Orr got a little bit offended with some of the flack that went his way. Is the concern that now on the back of that they go too hard for too long? That's exactly what they said they would take the risk of doing. Now, in 2020, to their credit, our Reserve Bank is the only one that actually came out and said, we're going to deliberately take the risk of easing monetary policy too much because it's better to do that and generate inflation down the track, which we'll need to fight, than not easing enough and generating a downward spiral, you know, prices, the economy, 1930s, Great Depression. So, you know, that was the appropriate uh, thing to take. But when they started uh, tightening monetary policy in 2021, in one publication, they said, we've changed our least regrets policy. That's what we call it. And they did explicitly say, uh, we're now going to take the risk that maybe we tighten monetary too much for, for too long, because inflation was simply too high and it surprised all of us in 21. I reckon the mistake he made was not reducing rates so low for so long. It was not peeling back LVRs. If we had DTIs, it would have stopped the housing bubble, but he could have pulled LVRs back. You know, investors didn't need all that money. They just speculated with it. Yeah. So he, he actually solely instigated the housing bubble. But he yeah. also he also dropped I was very OCR. grateful for it. I sold all my houses house in 2021, but um, so I give an A. Um, so what happened with interest rates? When will interest rates drop? Um, it's all it's pretty split a third a third a third. Um, first quarter twenty twenty five forty percent of you think um, it'll be first quarter next year. 
Last quarter of 2024, that's Tony's prediction, 32% of you. <clears throat> and 27% think it'll be second quarter of 2025. Mm. Interesting. Right, I've got one last poll which I'd like to, to, to run. And that is, should we fire Adrian Orr? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Carl, you guys can't vote. <laughs> I know what you'd vote. Well, here we are. Yes. This was the guy that went to um, uh, Switzerland to the reserve to the reserve bankers in Switzerland and gave them a speech on how the Reserve Bank of New Zealand was based on the principles of Tane Mahuta. And the uh, SAP is the, is the um, money he prints and the legislation is the leaves. And yeah, I, I do think he's got a, a very strong interest in diversity and climate. And he didn't have his eye on the ball on house price inflation, that's for sure. But it's a shame he didn't pay more attention to that. Because as a result, <clears throat> it's not guys like me that got hurt because I'm a long, long-term investor. Celestia and I sold a heap of houses in 2020 and 2021. We saw it coming uh, and we got out. And now we're buying back in. So he's not hurting us. Who he's hurting is the the new investors on the rob, property rung, and uh, and people who have fixed household incomes who can't cope with the rate rises. So um, you know it's very regressive socially what he did, and it just I think it showed a, a naivety and a lack of understanding of housing. Anyway, the good news is two thirds of you want to fire Adrian Orr, <laughs> along with me. I I think he's done a terrible job, and. Uh, I um, I lobby the Nats and I lobby ACT um, and at a meeting with, unashamedly, on behalf of New Zealand investors and at a meeting with Adrian Orr, uh, not Adrian Orr, goodness, I'd never do that, um, David Seymour um, a couple of weeks ago. And I said, David, can you please fire Adrian Orr? <laughs> like, he's, <laughs> just, he's just doing so much harm. He overdrives the market. He pushed rates too low. As, uh, and... and put too much inflation into the market. Now he's pushing rates too high, too long. He's harming New Zealand because a lot of businesses that would otherwise survive are being taken out of business. He's doing a lot of structural damage to the economy. It takes years to get these businesses back in, in mm. business. They're just going to Australia where they get paid double and they don't have to deal with the, the stress of New Zealand. I just think he needs to take his foot off the throat. Uh, it's actually his inflationary mistake that he's fixing when you, when you look at it. So I think two thirds of you would agree with me. Mm. Uh, Tony, thank you very much for coming once again at short notice. Really appreciate it. Yep, no problem, Matt. All the best, everybody. Ta -da. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Right, that was that was fun. Um, Chris, I think you're next up. Welcome. Oh, you're you going to tell us all about finance and uh, what's going on in the finance markets. What, is, what are you seeing? Are you seeing that there's a heap of investors out there at the moment? On the, on uh, the that I found interesting is I keep a big eye on Tony's commentary and and he's definitely been saying the, the investor demand's low and the Reserve Bank, I think, since 2014 have been keeping stats on first home buyers, own occupied activity and investor activity. And, and the percentage of total lending for first home buyer activities, I think the highest chunk of that that it's been in the last decade where investor demand's the lowest. But what we've seen is, um, like last year, there was just no one. And you know, when I say no one, there was almost no activity at all. Uh, I think most people were waiting to see what the the configuration of of, of a government was going to be. And we kicked off this year and started to get quite a bit of quite a bit of demand. And a lot of it's more the older time investors who have gone through the GFC. They've seen that, you know, asset prices do bounce back, uh, and a lot of them are getting ready. And so they're not necessarily just running out there buying, but they're getting getting ready because they know that this is unfortunately going to be a bit of, bit of blood on the ground. There's going to be people who, who went too far and, and and there's going to be the ability to get some assets at pretty just distressed prices. Yeah, Tony was talking about um, buying <clears throat> and, you know, timing of buying and, and and at one point in his presentation. And I sort of wanted to, wanted to cut it and say, and on the other side, don't sell. Yeah. Because in the last two cycles when we've been around as chartered, chartered accountants and giving advice, uh, a very popular bit of advice we've given to people at this stage in the cycle where things have crashed is ask yourself what the property's worth in five, eight years' time. And that's your answer to whether you should sell now. Sure, it's tough and you have to stretch. But, you know, 
if you try and buy that property back in five to eight years, it'll be a lot more expensive than it is now. Just I'll, 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 I'll use an example of a funding product where we're getting quite a bit of demand for at the moment, but especially quite a few investors who are asset rich, maybe a little bit cash poor. They may be getting hit with some of these rates and insurance hikes that we were talking about earlier. They're sitting there going, well, we, but they're better to potentially kind of maybe pay a little bit more on, on financing costs to raise some cash. And they might still sell a property, but they're looking to put that off 12, 24 months where it might be a better market. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it sounds obvious, but you sell at the peak and you buy at the bottom. Yeah. And fear and greed work against it because at the peak, you're as greedy as anything. So you hang on to it wanting more growth and you buy more and you end up buying at the peak if you uh, invest emotionally. <clears throat> and then the the wind goes out of the sails and you get fearful and in a year or two, it gets increasingly fearful. And, you know, spreadsheet investors will think, goodness, the house price went down 10% two years ago, 10% last year. Does that mean in the next eight years, they'll go down 100% and they'll be free? Uh, no, they will reach their bottom. And I think they did that. I showed you John Butts data, it, they're bouncing. And so you hit the intrinsic floor of the market and then it bounces along the bottom and then immigration builds, incomes build, rents go up, what was previously unaffordable becomes affordable, what was previously expensive becomes normal, immigrants build demand, uh, developers stop building, the whole thing builds up again. It's five years. Uh, and so it takes longer than it, than it looks. But if you're thinking about selling, uh, my advice is if you can possibly hang on, don't take the bottom of the market. Um, you know, do your numbers. Don't don't take too much risk and end up being mortgage sold. But anyway, Chris, I'll shut up and let you speak. Um, Thank you, Matt. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, quick intro myself. Been running Chris Peterson Mortgages, which is a mortgage broking business. Um, I predominantly deal in the property investor, property trader, property developer space, but we we deal with uh, the whole market, including first home buyers. Been investing for over 20 years myself. Uh, we're the main sponsor of the Auckland Property Investors Association, or have been, and also the Northland Property Investors Association. And I'm a few pages down from Matt uh, on the New Zealand Property Investor Magazine uh, as well. Um, now, many of you will have seen some version of this, which is like a, a property clock. And while we'll all have debates maybe on where we are actually in the clock, um, it kind of tends to work like this each cycle. And I think we're probably somewhere in the in the slump part, whether we're closer to, to three or six o'clock is debatable. Um, but we're definitely seeing situations which we normally see in, in this part of a cycle where, as an example, if you go back to 2021, it was very hard to get a tradie to answer your phone. When now I was out having a beer with a, a bunch of tradies probably a couple of weeks back and, and a lot of them are really struggling to, to, to get work. Um, we're going into that, that you know, winter period where it's definitely a buyer's market. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback where there's a pretty significant gap between vendor uh, price expectations and what buyers are willing to pay. And from a finance point of view, which of course I'm what I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate on, um, two things which I want to talk about is oh, I'm keeping a big eye on where interest rates will drop, as I think that's going to probably be the first sign of stimulating a recovery. And also a second part, which we normally tend to see a lot further into the property cycle, which is where kind of credit tends to relax. Uh, but what I'm seeing at the moment is, unlike previous property cycles where credit can be quite tight, uh, especially when you're going through a slump, uh, the banks at the moment actually have a bit of an appetite to lend. If anything, in my opinion, it's more a case of them being overregulated, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit later. So first, you have a chat about interest rates, and, and Tony's uh, already had a bit of a talk about this. Um, as he said, the Reserve Bank is projecting a mid next year before potentially any uh, official cash rate reduction. Most bank economists are predicting anywhere from like November this year through to, to mid next year. Uh, happy that I, I coincided with with Tony's pick. I'm I'm personally picking November, and I suppose the two key things I'm looking at between now and then is you know inflation and in particular non tradable inflation that that Tony was talking about and also how high unemployment, I suppose, keeps ramping uh, over the next six months. So key dates, I suppose, I'm looking for is the next official cash rate review is pretty much smack on a month away. It's uh, the 10th of July. Um, what's going to pretty much happen, unless there's something uh, very unforeseen happens, is that the Reserve Bank's going to keep the cash rate at 5.5%. They're going to have a policy statement come out which pretty much says nothing. 
because what they're going to be looking at is the following week, where the following week on the 17th of July, they get an understanding of how inflation has been tracking for the current quarter that we're in. What they'll also be looking at is a few weeks later is on the 7th of August is how much the unemployment rate uh, hiked. So in the, the first quarter of this year, I think off the top of my head, it was about 38,000 people lost their job. I'm expecting that number to, to hike quite a bit more in the current quarter that we're in. And so we've got this uh, next official cash rate review on the 14th of August. So disregard the one on the 10th, not much is going to happen. Move forward to this 14th of August. And I think if the inflation numbers especially those non-traded tradables that Tony was talking about uh, are looking a bit better and the unemployment rates looking very ugly, you're going to start to see quite a bit of uh, talk, especially from like, the property sectors, retail, hospitality, the areas which are getting really hit quite hard uh, in regards to that we need to see this cash rate come down. Um, the Reserve Bank and Adrian Roy in particular are jawboning. Um, they're very much are aware that what they do with a cash rate is one thing, their commentary is, is, is also very important. So when most of us may pay attention to the actual number, the commentary has the ability to move markets by itself. And so I think as Tony alluded to, um, pretty much what Adrian Orr is going to be doing, and it is probably correct to do, is keep scaring everyone to keep their hands in their pocket and not start spending again on the expectation that rates are coming down quickly. So I'm expecting there to start to be a bit of media activity in regards to, you know, when we need this cash rate uh, cut, but I don't think anything's going to happen uh, at August. And then um, a few months after that, we've got, got the same activity going on. The next inflation update for the, the September quarter comes out on the 16th of October. We get the unemployment update a few weeks later, and I'm, I'm looking at this 27th of November as a pretty good chance of a cut. And I also sit there and go, I think the Reserve Bank will be looking at it. They're going to be aware that the economy is taking an absolutely hammering at the moment. Um, you just have to go to a retail store. Um, if you go to, you know, I was out for dinner um, uh, in Auckland, at a pretty busy part of Auckland, about a month or so on a Friday night. And this is the, the type of place that would normally be absolutely packed to, to midnight. And it was dead by 9pm by at night on a Friday. So it kind of gives you a bit of an indication of, of what's going on behind the scenes that people might still go out, but they're not spending too much money. And obviously going into that Christmas uh, kind of time of season, the Reserve Bank's going to be very aware there's probably a lot of businesses, especially in that, that hospitality retail kind of sector, which they're going to be hanging on. And if they don't make a few dollars over that, that time of year, there'll be a lot more unemployment, a lot more business failure. So if they're starting to kind of get the feeling that inflation's under control, I think they might look at starting to give some relief uh, just before Christmas. Now, so recommendations here. Uh, definitely don't fix too long. I was talking to a person who'd been recommended a two-year rate uh, today. I think that's personally far too long, and I'm giving general advice here. Obviously, you want to look at your, your individual situation. Uh, the most recommended rate we're giving a business at the moment is, is, is six months. Um, because roughly with most bank offerings at the moment, the six and the 12 month rate is, is pretty much the same. So I'll be recommending taking a six. And then for some reason, if it looks like the cash rate's not coming down as fast as, as we thought, you can always kind of roll that over. Uh, don't just look at the interest rates which are being offered. Also look at the cash contributions which you can get from a bank. So I was sitting uh, at an investment advisory um, uh, business. There's myself, another mortgage broker who get dragged in once a year. Uh, along with a lot of fund managers from New Zealand and Australia. Um, they come over and they go to the Reserve Bank, a number of banks, a couple of the credit agencies to get an understanding of what's happening in the economy. And one of them raised that what, what their belief is when looking at the New Zealand market in comparison to Australia is what they think what the banks do here is they keep the uh, interest rates higher than probably what they should. So I think they're, they're, they're price gouging on rate. But if you want to go from one bank to another, you can get these quite large cash contributions. So they do this in Australia, but not to the, to the, to the same extent. And so what that's effectively doing is it's kind of gouging the uh, existing customers who either can't move or won't move. So for those of you who don't know what a cash contribution is, um, it's effectively a bribe. Um, it's a bribe from one bank you know, to effectively take your business from an existing bank over. Every now and then the existing bank might give you a little bit of a bribe to stay. But the general uh, situation is that banks are, are not giving you kind of cash to stay. It's more when you're going from existing bank to a new bank. So as an example, um, if you had a million dollar loan or a million dollars in debt, uh, you might be getting anywhere from seven to, to $10,000 in cash to move from existing bank over to the new bank. 
And just the point, I suppose, on that, Anthony will be talking after me. I think he'll be talking about things like rollover relief. Uh, and I think with some of the changes that are coming from 1 July, there's a good chance that some of you might be looking at with some of the changes to move uh, like a property from one entity across to another. That obviously in most cases, is, or pretty much all cases, is going to involve using a solicitor. So you're going to have to be kind of dipping into your pocket to pay for that. Quite often there may be benefit going from existing bank to new bank at the same time you go from existing entity across into the new entity and get in the new bank to throw cash to effectively cover some of those costs for you. So besides price of credit, the other thing I want to have a, a big talk about is availability of credit. And while normally at this stage of a, of a cycle, we'd see everything being exceptionally tight. I remember being on a, a desk in Matt's floor, uh, you know, middle of the GFC. This is around 2008, 2009. And, you know, putting applications into banks and banks, you know, really, really strong clients and banks not wanting to lend at all. In my opinion, we've got quite a different market now. We've seen uh, a number of relaxing points across the year. BNZ's bought out the first kind of 95% home loan I've seen in a decade outside of a government-backed product. TSB bought a, bought back a 10-year interest-only product. You know, Kiwi Bank um, has around 8% of the, the mortgage market share. They're writing over double their market share because they're aggressively going into the market at the moment. ASB backed out of the market last year. Uh, they were the worst from a price point of view. They're now trying to buy all the customers back they've lost. Um, non-banks, we've caught up with a huge amount of non-banks this year who are discussing, you know, innovating, trying to create products, bring them to market because they want to lend more. This is all signs of credit relaxing, not a tight credit market. And it's quite different to what we normally see in that slump part of the cycle. So, you know, good signs of credit relaxing. Um, if we look at the, the, the government, we've got the coalition. David Seymour has kind of appointed himself the Minister of Regulation, but he's really the Minister of, of Deregulation. He's trying to pull as much red tape away as he can. Uh, National um, MP is also doing a further investigation into the triple CFA. But the big elephant in the room is the debt to incomes. And I know Matt did a bit of a webinar uh, on this a, a few months ago, but I thought I'd throw some comments on, into this as well. So the confirmed rules uh, that were confirmed a week or two back is that own occupied lending is going to be restricted to six times uh, household income. And so 20% of the uh, lending, which is applied to own occupied lending, outside that six times multiplier. We're looking at investor lending that's going to be limited to seven times household income. And again, 20% of the total lending uh, that's applied for investment lending can be outside that rule. So if we're looking at, you've got 700,000 of investment debt, you need 100K of household income, and note that's a gross uh, income figure. We're not looking at net, net income here. If you're looking at buying a property for yourself uh, and you've got $100,000 of income, that's going to limit you uh, to $600,000 unless you can get access to that 20% exclusion. So note that while the banks are using gross uh, earned income, they're using scaled rental income. And there's quite a difference from bank to bank at the moment on that. Yeah, what is the scaling, Chris? Can you tell us about that? So that takes... So, I mean, I think at the moment, if, if, if you kind of work off, say, 75 to 80%, um, it's been moving all over the place. Because mm -hmm. It's traditionally been probably half the banks have been at 75, half have been at 80. What happened if we go back a few years ago when the... Um, Labor government brought in the removal of the interest deductibility. Some banks freaked out and suddenly thought they had to change all the rules and some banks scaled all the way down to 55. Um, what the also then happened is the bank started, there was a new rule that was put in that they had to start itemizing every bit of rates and insurance. So they started, we ended up with a situation where some banks were hardly taking any rent. Some banks were taking as high as 88% of rent. To me, I think it's going to end up being in that 75 to 80% uh, that we've taken into, into uh, account over time. There's exemptions to uh, the, the DTI rules. I'm not going to talk too much about these, probably just a quick couple of comments. Uh, the, the new build lending, I mean, in some ways, it, it looks like an uh, obvious rule. It's And I suppose what I'll be saying with, with DTI is the closest... Um, tool, I suppose, we, we have to look at over the last 10 years has been how the Reserve Bank has used the loan-to-value ratio tools. So pretty much all of these things here have also been exempt on the LVRs. Uh, it's worth looking at the LVRs over a decade and seeing how the Reserve Bank's manipulated them to, to change the market. So new build lending, as an example, while you look at it and go, that's exempt, that has actually tended to cause issues for people because 
um, let's say from an LVR point of view, if I was buying a million dollar property and that was exempt on the LVRs, I might be able to get an $800,000 investment loan. The problem is, the day after I buy it, it's now not a new build, it's an existing property. And so what that's meant under the current rules, I can only borrow 650,000 against it. So if I go back to that bank, I'm effectively negative 150K in equity. How this plays out with DTIs, we've still got to see. Um, I do have a concern, for example, in regards to business loans. A huge amount of New Zealanders is, you know, business, especially in the SME space, is run off uh, the back of their own home, maybe run off the back of a couple of investment properties. And while they're saying business loans are exempt, uh, I think you'll find that in a lot of cases, people will struggle to access a lot of their equity um, to keep maybe kind of progress in their business forward. So a client example, I thought this was maybe the easiest way to show you how um, banks are assessing a, a, a client today and how DTIs may affect things right now and how this might kind of change over the next few years. Um, I very much think DTI is political. I think Adrian Orr has tried to ram this through as quickly as possible while interest rates are high because I don't the DTIs I don't think will have much of an effect for the next 12 months or so, but I expect uh, maybe a little bit down the track that they're going to start to bite. So if we have a bit of a look at Joe and Mary here, they've got 110k household income. They've got their own home with no mortgage on it. They've got a couple of rental properties with a million dollars of debt, and they rent these out for a thousand bucks a week. So if we look at how a bank assesses affordability today, so what they're looking at is everything on a, on a monthly basis. So we take Joe and Mary's income, we take the tax out, and we're looking at about 3730 uh, you know, net. So that's the after-tax income for each of them on a monthly basis. We take the rental income, put that into a monthly basis and take 80% of that. We add up all of those figures and from the bank point of view, we've got just under 11,000 or $10,926 which the bank will use for income. Now, from a expenses point of view, uh, we take out some living expenses and note that the banks don't look at what Joe and Mary are actually paying on their mortgages. They've got their own way of assessing it. So they take the million dollars and they put it through these high test rates. So you can see that 9%, that's probably the average test rate banks are using. So Joe and Mary's real interest rate could be 3%, 5%, 6%. I mean, as an example, let's say uh, Joe and Mary actually had a million dollars of debt and the interest rate was 6% interest only, they'd be paying 5,000 bucks a month. Doesn't matter what they're paying. The, 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 the banks are gonna put it through on this assessment rate and it's gonna come out at this 8,047 bucks per month. So we add up the living expenses and the mortgage amount as per what the bank's calculated. And in the bank's eyes, they've got 11,547 11, going out a month. So we've got the income, uh, the 10,926 minus the expenses, 11,547. And you've got this deficit at the bottom. So Joe and Mary are at a brick wall right now on standard bank affordability metrics. So let's have a look at how they would uh, basically work as of today under a debt to income basis. We take their gross annual earned income, 110,000. We take the rental income, so that's the 52K a year, scale it by 80%, that's 41,600. We add the 110 and the 41,600 together, and we've got the total income we can use, times that by seven, and we've got just over the million dollar mark. So a million and 61,000. So keep in mind, under standard bank assessment criteria, they can't borrow a cent, under a DTI formula as of today, they could actually go, go borrow another 60,000. So this is where I think the DTIs, you know, it's quite easy to look at this and go, well, this is not having much of an effect. And I think this is almost designed, this is just gonna slip in and not get too much media attention. Uh, now, what's worth noticing though, is as real interest rates drop, the test rates drop. So if you remember on a couple of slides back, I was referring to that 9% test rate that the banks were using when they were assessing what um, the, the clients can borrow. And if we're looking at interest rates over the last five, six years, the, the pink and blue lines are the average one and two year rates offered over that time from the bank. The black dots are the actual assessment rates that the banks have been using to assess what people can borrow. And if you look at the, the top right kind of part of the, uh, the, the graph, as interest rates have increased, you can see the test rates moving up. What's naturally gonna happen as interest rates drop those test rates will drop down. That's you know the, how how people get assessed is actually going to improve. So if we have a bit of a look at Joe and Mary in the future, they've had a bit of a pay bump. 
they're up to 120k. Still got no mortgage on their their personal home. Their rental properties are exactly the same position. They've got a million dollars of debt, and they've had a bit of a, a rental increase. They're up to 1,200 bucks per week in rent. So how the bank's looking at them at this stage here? Uh, they're still using Joe and Mary's net income. They've, of course, got a bit more rental income coming in. So they've got $12,185 that the bank will take into consideration as their net monthly income. Still taking out some living expenses. Their benefit is how the bank assesses the mortgages. So that, that test rate's now dropped. So the million dollars is now being assessed at a test rate of 6%. And so what's happening is the total income minus total expenses, we've actually got a surplus. So now what's happening is Joe and Mary can actually borrow another half a million dollars, which might mean they can go buy another rental property in one of the regions potentially. We now overlay that with how the debt to income rules will work. But the gross annual income, 120K, we take the scaled rental income, which is roughly 50,000, add those together, and we've got just under 170K. We times that by seven, and we've now got just under 1.12. So what's happened here is as the test rates have dropped in the normal situation before DTIs, Joe and Mary could go borrow roughly, let's say, another half a million dollars. But because we've got this debt to income rule, which is coming in very shortly, their borrowing has been limited to roughly only 130000 above what they could actually borrow today. They're going to be very limited. And obviously, with another 130 k they're not going to be able to go buy another rental property through a bank anyway. So... These graphs here are, are probably give you a bit of an indication of how things kind of may play out. So the graph firstly on the left is looking over the last five, six years at the percentage of total new lending to the owner-occupied market uh, with a debt to income above six times. The graph on the right is the percentage of total new lending to investors with a debt to income above seven times. So obviously looking at the total rules. The line in the middle, that's the 20% threshold which of course has been proposed, which the banks can do above. So that's the, uh, the, the new exemption rule. Now, for me personally, I exclude that 2020 to 22 market because that's been inflated with very, very low interest rates uh, through the COVID period. If you look at the graph on the left first and focus, I suppose, on the blue line, I think the first home buyers are going to be fine. They're, they're actually going to be able to continue to buy. And I think that's you know probably been designed that way. The other own occupied market may get hit a bit, but if you look over to the graph to the uh, the right, and I'll probably sit there and focus on that 19, sorry, 2019 to 2020 market before COVID really hit. You can see there's quite a bit of lending that the banks were doing. You know, they're, they're doing up to 25 to 30% of lending uh, above the seven times multiplier. So that's definitely going to have a fit, an effect. Uh, disregard on that graph on the right, I think that market from 22 to 23, the investment lending has been absolutely slammed because of high interest rates and it was always going to come down a lot. I think you have to look back to that pre-COVID mark to, to really get an indication of how, how much lending may get affected over time. Chris, um, go back to those graphs, please. So actually, you might call that graph on the right. If you gave that a label, I would call that Adrian Orr's house price inflation mistake. Yes, I agree, mean, 100%. I mean, and ironically, the, the only thing that DTIs would actually probably do is stop Adrian Orr from making such a mess again, you know? That oh, they actually... 100%, yes. They're actually fit for purpose, as long as they don't crank them down too tight as they drop rates. Uh, because if they crank them down too tight, what you'll find is that nobody wants to build anything because there's no growth. And if there's no growth, there's no prospect of making gains and so investors will just pull out of the market and and it might be that there's low growth and a protracted period where investors say well we don't want to invest in this market uh, and then the government will join the dots and say well we're going to pull these out because there's not enough growth and expectation of growth to attract capital and the government can't afford to fund this because landlords are 80 percent of the residential um stock in the, in the country, uh, for, you know, the landlord stock in the country, and the, and the government will work this out, join the dots, and perhaps our Minister of Regulation uh, will join the dots and say, we've got to pull these out because they're actually constraining investment. I 100% agree. It'd be quite yeah. easy to take It's these. a cycle, right? It's a cycle. I, I actually think, um, I think they're very socially regressive because they're going to make it harder on people with lower incomes. They're not going to stop me. They're not going to stop you. 
and investors with high incomes. Uh, so it's quite socially regressive. And I think you'll you'll just see that it'll be um, something that comes and goes because if it, if it stops people supplying housing, i.e. buying them to make them out, um, then developers will just wither and supply will wither and the the government will join the dots and pull these rules out. Yeah, I mean, it'd be quite easy to take these red arrows, point them to the, the top lines of the graph and retitle it, you know, Adrian North because... Yeah effectively created those those little bubble periods. And, you know, we were having that chat earlier today where, to me, we've got a continuation of rules coming in which are designed to dampen demand. If they want to try and fix up the housing issue, they've got to focus on the supply side. Yep. Yep. And they don't have their eye on that ball at the moment. No. They talk about it, but this sort of stuff is completely contrary to it. And I mean, some final DTI points, uh, the New Zealand Banking Association, um, I think all the property investor associations, I think you might have been actually been involved in this, Matt, were pushing for more relaxed investment rules. So the submissions that were put forward to the Reserve Bank were asking for a 30% threshold, not the 20%. Um, now, that was put in and the Reserve Bank ignored them. And as we spoke earlier on with, with Tony, um, this is political. Um, the Reserve Bank, in my opinion, is going well outside their mandate. Uh, they're trying to interfere in the, in the housing market where um, you know he, he's created an absolute mess in regards to inflation and he should be focusing on that. Uh, what income gets used uh, will be interesting. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, banks don't actually treat all the income sources the same. So if you're just on a standard salaried income, that's fine. It's probably going to be pretty similar from bank to bank, but many of you may have, you know, commission income. Uh, some banks take bonus income, others don't. Um, you know, rental income. We were just having a chat there about these different percentages taken from bank to bank. Um, so all of the different kind of out-of-the-box income types can be treated quite differently. Um, many of you listening may be self-employed. Um, some banks will sit there and will average years. Others will look, you know, at your most recent year. Um, something which for me is of interest is I actually received an email from a, a bank yesterday. I'll have a chat with you about this, Matt. I'll be interested to see what we, we you think this is. I, I think this sounds like the Reserve Bank is, is about to interfere further. So I received a communication from one of the banks a couple of days ago, uh, and it says we are required to include and evidence all sustainable income that, that is greater than $1,000. Sustainable income is defined as income that can be verified and reasonably expected to continue on an ongoing, ongoing basis in the future. An example might be a client receiving board income from three boarders. As the evidence from the third border is considered sustainable and ongoing, we must also receive evidence of it and note it in the section of, the, of our affordability calculator, even though we do not include it in the servicing of the loan. So the bank, what the bank's saying is we're not going to include this, but we've got to take evidence of this. Well, that sounds to me like the Reserve Bank saying we want to track all types of, of income and that to me potentially sounds like they want to standardize everything any opinions there i have to think about that i mean mm. uh maybe they're just wanting to better understand uh household incomes and mm. and the components of it and there's sort of a hidden economy there like water income yeah uh, well, we'll see how it plays out is that, is that an unhealthy thing is that a bad thing uh, I'm just concerned that at the moment, I think, I look at it and go, if you go back to this previous slide here, sorry, um, I think from a, oh, one second, I think from a bank point of view, a bank's job is to assess credit risk. Uh, I think it should be on the bank to sit there and go, okay, we can, you know, look at bonus income and we can take our own assumption of how much bonus income we can take into consideration. I'm worried that the Reserve Bank's going to sit there and go, this is how much of each of these different classifications you can take into account. Wow. Interesting. Uh, the one positive is that while DTIs have been brought in come 1 July, the loan-to-value rules on second-hand investment properties, so currently the maximum you can uh, lend on a second-hand investment is 65%, uh, that's going to be pushed out to 70%, so a, a little bit of relaxing there. Um, so recommendations, I suppose, for, for those of you before you look to borrow further, um, review your current borrowing. Um, it's worth getting a, an understanding of, of how a bank looks at you. Uh, a, a lot of you might look at your cash flow and think, okay, there's going to be some some good buys coming up over the next 12 months. Uh, and you might want to get a position to, to buy, but it's also worth understanding how a bank looks at you so you don't put yourself under too much stress. 
For those of you who are carrying debt on interest only, for a long time, it's been quite easy to roll interest only over again and again and again. Uh, that, you know, that time has probably ended. Um, if we go back to well, probably 18, 24 months, um, suddenly we, we entered a, a market where banks were making people go through full applications before they would roll uh, interest only periods over. Uh, and if you didn't meet their current criteria, then the bank was forcing you onto p &I, which is completely stupid. If you think about it, the bank was basically putting you through an application process to check your affordability. And if you couldn't afford it, they were making you pay more. There's no common sense here at all. Now, thankfully, in the last 12 months, um, someone's changed the rule behind the scenes. And we've seen a situation where banks have had it made it easier to roll over. Uh, however, I think that with debt to incomes coming in, you might find the rolling over of interest only becomes harder. So just check how your cash flow is going to look if you get forced onto p and uh, A lot of cases, what we've done is extend loan terms out. Um, I won't talk about that kind of too much uh, at the moment, but there's, there's benefits where you can extend loan terms out. It can improve your cash flow. Uh, and in some cases, it can improve bank affordability as well. Uh, many of you have been investing for, for quite a long time might have a lot of equity and banks are really good at taking too much security. Uh, banks will grab as much as they can. Our, our process has always been to give as little as possible. So a lot of cases, if you've got too much security, look to drop properties out uh, with the banks. Now, I think moving forward, I mean, we're doing more and more non-bank lending as a business and just wanted to kind of finish off with a, a couple of examples of solutions that we're seeing and using more and more. Um, so we're seeing a lot of investors, and I think Tony alluded to it uh, earlier, people who are maybe kind of asset rich, but probably a little bit cash strapped. And so one lender, what they're doing is, I suppose, a standard process for most lenders, definitely banks, is to look at your whole uh, position. So that's to take a look at all your properties, all your mortgages, and take everything into consideration. What this particular lender will do is they're going to disregard your, your all of your property position except for the property that you're going to give to them. What they're then going to do is assess it based on the rental income and the debt you're looking to get. So if the scaled rental income covers a scaled debt, that there's a very good chance they're going to approve you even if the rest of your position doesn't stack up. Now, there's other products out there which... Uh, are willing to look at this on a standalone basis, but they tend to be more short term. What's great about this product is that they can do up to 30 year loan with 10 years interest only. So where we've been doing a number of um, mortgages for, for, for this type of client recently is investors who might have a strong asset base, they're feeling a bit cash strapped, they might have an unencumbered property and they need some cash. So I've been talking to an investor earlier today who's got best part of 25 mil of property, $6 million of bank debt, He's got half a dozen you know, uh, unencumbered properties and he just wants a bit of cash to get him through the next uh, 12, 24 months so he doesn't have to sell a property now. So we're going to throw one property at this lender. He's going to borrow you know, 250k cash and that will buy him time. Uh, there's some of the right. Um, you're talking eight and a half to nine and a half. Oh, yeah. So I mean, for, a common thing we're also doing is you, we've got clients who might have revolving credit facilities, which they've been, used, they've been living off their revolving credit. Well, revolving credit rates are eight to eight and a half. So we've had some clients who've been throwing a, a property at the non-bank. They've raised the cash, paid the revolving credit back down. Um, older retired people who often obviously don't have the, the cash flow coming in, uh, we're starting to see kind of more demand by them because the banks won't generally, generally tend to fund that, that, that type of person. But often they've got a lowly geared portfolio. Uh, we can often throw a property across to this fund, the funder where they can raise a a reasonably priced mortgage with them. And as I said, developers, um, there's some developers who have ended up with residual stock. They maybe didn't get pre-sales earlier in the in the market and they're not wanting to sell now, they wanted to buy time. So there's quite a bit of demand if, if you're in that, that market. Um, another quick example is in investors getting hit by these stringent bank affordability rules. So a real client example is a couple with uh, no kids. Uh, the husband was on 170,000, the wife on 130. Real chunky property portfolio, so 16 mil of property. They're conservatively geared, at, you know, three and a half million dollars of debt, so they're a really good kind of credit risk. Um, most of their debt was on good rates, but on short terms. And these these clients are feeling great. They're the classic client who's looking at their position. They've got heaps of equity, good cash flow, uh, and they want to be basically looking to buy over this winter, but the banks won't fund them. 
Now, the, the issue is, is with how the banks fund, and this is a snapshot of one small portion of their debt, is um, you can see on the, the first column here the breakdown of their mortgages. The second uh, column is the different rates that the, the client's paying on each of those loan splits. The, rate, right, the loans are all expiring in uh, nine years. And so what the banks are doing is they're taking the, the loan split, they're assessing it on the remaining nine-year loan term, and they're assessing it at an interest rate close to 9%. So when it goes through the bank test calculator, if I use this top line as an example, the bank test calculator says that the client's paying $536 per month. In reality, what the client's doing is paying that, um, they're paying an interest-only mortgage, and so they're only paying $172. So just to reiterate, Bank calculator says 536 a month on the top line. They're actually only paying $172. So in, in this uh, one bank, and the client's got four different banks, by the time you put the loan splits through, the bank calculator says that they're paying uh, $11,589 per month. The client is actually only paying 3637. When you put that over four different banks, the difference between reality and what the bank calculator says is huge. So again, the bank's view on the client's position looks like this. You got about uh, client one's got about ten thousand net income. Client two's got about eight thousand net income. You've got the rental income coming in, and you've got about thirty thousand uh, net income that can be used for mortgage borrowing on a monthly basis. Take away the living expenses and take away the bank's view of what their payments are, and they've got this big deficit per month. Now, the difference between bank and some of the non-bank solutions we've got is that where some of the non-banks will look at what they are actually paying. So the big difference, I just want to go back a slide here, we've got a deficit with a bank of basically 7,600 a month. Non-bank, oh, sorry, we go to a non-bank, and suddenly because they will look at the actual payments the client's um, paying a month, we've now got a large surplus. So this client, we can go to a non-bank and put them in a position where they can buy again. So a quick couple of points on this. Um, if you're looking to buy, there's no bank statements required. They don't need mortgage history. They don't need transactional statements. If you've got to refinance a property over, they only need the mortgage statements on the property that's coming over. They don't need anything else. The way they're assessing the debt that goes to them is 1% above the actual rate. Uh, and this lender is sitting outside the reserve bank rules. So Adrian Orr can bugger off uh, in regards to basically dealing with this lender. They have the ability to fund outside it. And so their floating rate is about 8.6%, um, which obviously we hopefully will be tracking down uh, if the cash rates decrease. So there's some solutions starting to, to come in, in, into, the, into the market, even if you can't access funding through the banks. Um, so there's kind of contact details. For any of you who, I suppose, want to have a look at uh, your position, you want to see how you stack up with a bank, if you jump on the bank website, uh, they've got, got mortgage calculators which don't work. We've got access to the actual calculators they use behind the scenes and quite happy to have a bit of a, a chat in regards to your position and show you what you can do. Thanks, Matt. That was excellent. Thank you. I'll just see, I'll just see if there's anything in here that you didn't cover. DTI documentation by the Reserve Bank says banks must treat all gross income at 100%. So banks are going against... Reserve Bank rules by discounting to 80%, says Paul McGill. Interesting, Paul. DTI stop property investors building houses. Exactly, Paul. Exactly. Adrian Orr is social engineering. Agreed, Paul. Uh, um, if I was a cat, I'd start purring. Um, I agree with you. Uh, Terence uh, Harvey asks, uh, does DTI actually replace the bank test rates or should there be a situation where the bank uses both? Um, sorry, which one was that? Sorry. So, does the DTI actually replace the bank no, test rate? No, 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 the, 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 bank, the banks will use the more onerous of the two. So, if you look at the example I used with uh, John Mary in the current market, uh, the bank assessments more onerous than DTIs. What's going to happen as interest rates drop, DTIs will take over and will become the more onerous measure. Shishan asks, does rental income count in DTI? Yes. But it's scaled. Yeah. Yep. Paul asks Chris um, to move a house to do substitution with no increase in lending. Can your bank require you to do a finance application to do this? They can, so it's kind of probably bank dependent. Uh, but so, sometimes you can substitute without without that being required. Uh, Matt Pang uh, asks 
He's, or he says he still thinks the worst is yet to come. Our motor vehicle loan ledger arrears have doubled. Um, retail spending has plummeted. Now it's a moment of truth to identify those who've been swimming naked. Uh, those who have already been cashed up and sitting with capital side will reap significant awards. Rewards. Mac, I, I tend to agree with you, but I think the property markets had the worst of it. Um, it's and it's bouncing. Uh, interest rates will ease back, but I think that Adrian Orr has wrecked a bunch of households and businesses, and you're going to see a lot of liquidations. We didn't need to have them. He should have been easing rates off earlier. Yeah, he's had his foot on the throats of New Zealand households uh, during a cost of living crisis. They didn't need, and the only reason he's had to do it is because he pumped the market so hard in 2020. Um, you know, and I take Tony's comment that um, he did make some strong moves early on, but in my opinion, he should have dropped the LBRs back and stopped the house prices going through the roof. Should have choked off the supply of money while he dropped the cost of money. I think it's worth not. I think Tony's comment where um, monetary policy takes eighteen to twenty-four months to filter through. So yeah. we've got something like we've got something like fifteen to twenty percent of mortgages still to drop off low low rates and go into higher rates. So. That, that's taking a lot more money out of the economy still, which means that the economy is still going to get whacked a whole lot harder over the next six months without any you know further monetary policy tightening. Um, so I'm still concerned that while I think November should be the first relaxation, I'm worried that they they decide to push it into next year and really hurt this economy. Yep. They, well, DTRs are going to have people on the fringes, aren't they? And... This, I think they're socially regressive. They're going to feed them to people with fair share of money. DTIs aren't going to be much of a news story for the next six or 12 months, but it's more a case of get ready for them before they bite. Yeah. I think that's the bulk of those questions. Somebody asked, uh, who do we rent our social houses to? Is it through KO or with uh, community housing providers? Alex, it's straight to the CHPs. Um, if, you tr if you try and deal through... Um, KO, uh, I find them difficult. The CHPs are much better dealing with tenants. They're often quite targeted. So, for example, Monte Cecilia in Auckland, uh, quite a good organisation to deal with. Emerge Aotearoa, Link, these sorts of organisations have um, excellent um, property managers and they're just good people to deal with. Simon, Simon's comments, interesting, that he's seen developers back. Is he? Oh, yep. Yeah. I see that, yeah. Well, they're back and forth, but are we going to build Simon? Because Simon's my planner. Mm. And uh, I'm consenting with you, Simon, but I'll sit on the consents, those larger developments, till the market conditions are right. Um, the stuff we're picking up, which is shovel-ready, uh, and I showed some of that at the beginning, you probably went on, Um you know, it's 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 cheap and it's consented by someone else, and we just build it. We don't even like the look at it, look of it, but we can build it cheap and sell it cheap, and that's what the market wants at the moment. Okay, um, Chris, thanks so much. Uh, what, Chris, you were talking about getting money for restructure. How did that work? Tying into Andy's <coughs> presentation. Um, you're talking about the cash contributions. Yeah. So, um, it goes back to, as I said, it's a bit of a bribe that, um banks will tend to do. So if you're at, and I'll pick on a bank, if you're with, and this is not a, a go at ASB because every bank works roughly the same way, but let's say you're at ASB and you've got a million dollar mortgage and you've been there for years. Uh, what tends to happen is that your main price negotiation tends to be on interest rate. In most cases, uh, ASB is not going to throw cash at you for the sake of it. On the flip side, what most other banks will do is if you decide to move your million dollar mortgage from ASB over to any other bank, most of the banks will throw a cash contribution and, and read that as a bribe for bringing that debt across. And so in most cases, the cash contribution is priced anywhere between 0.7 and 1%. So on that million dollars, that's seven to, to $10,000 of cash. Right. And so um, I suppose kind of with what Anthony's about to talk about now is in, in many cases, there may be benefits for the people listening to change entities potentially. That may be an opportunity to go from existing bank to new bank and change from existing entity into the new entity and, and get the new bank to throw that cash across as a way of minimising some of these transfer costs. Okay. So clients, for example, that want to move a property in their name 
to, say, a trust or a look-through company to get a step up in value yep. to increase the amount of debt over the asset, which becomes deductible, yep. um, they, in doing that, could get some cash back and help pay for the cost of that yep. and thereby fund their their uh, you know their restructure through uh, through bank um, rebates. Have a talk to GRA and then we can have a talk on, with, with them on the back of it and see the best way to minimise those costs. Yes, okay. Um, thank you. We realised that we were, um, we forgot to put a slide in, so I'm just banging it in right now and I'm trying to talk to you and be there at the same time, which I've done. Um, Anthony, are you good? Yes. Can you yep. hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Haven't, Welcome. Haven't participated so far. Thank you. This is Anthony Lipscomb, who is a partner at GRA. He runs our tax team and uh, he's going to run the tax update for us. Welcome, Anthony. So we are going to talk about the finalisation of the two-year bright line period and the new uh, interest limitation rules. I think it's been a while, at least since I've done one of these webinars, which means it's the first time uh, since the rules have been finalised that I've, I've spoken on them. We, we have known pretty much since the election that the bright line period is going to be reduced to um, two years. But we weren't sure of the precise details of when that would occur. We weren't sure about uh, what data would be applicable from. And we weren't sure whether it would apply to all property or not, but now we have the answers to that. So now we know. So here, here, here are the details. The bright line period reduces to two years for all property sales on or after 1 July. So all property in, in what are we now, the 11th of uh, June, in 20 days time, all residential property in New Zealand will instantaneously be subject to a two year bright line period. It's the date that you enter into the sale and purchase agreement that is key. The date that you enter into it sets the tone as to whether you are subject to the existing five and 10 year periods or the two year rule. So here's an example to illustrate that point. Calvin bought a residential property in 22, entered into an agreement to buy it more, more precisely, January 22, settled February 2022. So at the time that Calvin bought that property, the bright line period um, had been increased to 10 years. We'll assume it's not a new build for the sake of this example. Calvin's now looking to sell. Calvin's got a buyer that's that's mustard keen to buy, desperate to secure it, wants to enter into a purchase agreement on the 20th of June. So Calvin's thinking, I know the bright line period's reducing to two years. At the moment, I know my property's caught by that bright line period. So how about I enter into an agreement on the 20th of June, but I delay settlement until after the 1st of July 24. Calvin asks, will that mean that I am outside of Brightline because if I settle after 1 July, then it'll be a two-year rule and I'll be beyond two, two years. So here's the answer. Looking firstly, and I've already made this point, the um, Brightline clock started at the, the date of settlement and at the time that that was applicable um, was at the time that rather the agreement was entered into originally, that was uh, 10 years. Now, the date that the agreement is entered into is the 20th of June. And at that point, Calvin will have owned the property for just a little bit less than two and a half years. And because the bright line period at the time of purchase is 10 years and the agreement's entered into on the 20th of July, it means the old rules apply. And a 10-year bright line period is the relevant period. Calvin's selling within that 10-year bright line period and therefore scuppered by the bright line rule. On the other hand, if Calvin deferred entering into the sale agreement until on or after 1 July 2024, then the new two-year rule would apply and the sale would be outside of Brightline. So the moral of the story is, and we haven't got too long to wait, but if you are desperate to sell a property and that property is currently subject to a five-year or 10-year Brightline period, hold off entering into the sale and purchase agreement until on or after 1 July. You do not get the result you want by entering into the agreement before 
1 July and deferring settlement till after 1 July. It's the day that you enter into the agreement that determines whether you're subject to old rules or new rules. I think that should be pretty clear. The other uh, big change, of course, that the new government has brought to bear is the repeal of the interest non-deduction rules, as we've called them there. So the interest limitation rules have been repealed, kicking in from 1 April 2024. So in the financial year that just finished, the same um, interest limitation rules apply. There was uh, in the coalition agreement between National and ACT uh, an undertaking that the interest limitation um, ratio at 50% for the year to 31 March 24 would be lifted to 60 and perhaps that might apply to all property, but that didn't come to pass in the end. So it was status quo for the year to 31 March 2024, but from 1 April 2024, the changes come into effect, although interest is not fully deductible until the next income year. So current income year, interest is 80% deductible at least. If your interest was already going to be 100% deductible because you have borrowed to buy a new build or your borrowing relates to a property that's rented out as social housing, you already get 100% deductibility on your interest. You continue to get 100% deductibility on your interest. But if you had a property that was um, bought prior to 1 April 20, uh, 2021 and your interest deductions were being phased out, you're now back up to 80%. Or if you had a property that you bought after October 2021 that was not a new build, not social housing, and your interest was completely not deductible, that's now 80% deductible in the current year and will be 100% deductible uh, from the next income year on. So that's uh, excellent news. Yeah, great news. Uh, what that will mean is that the taxable profit that you may well have been making, because in the year to 30 on March 24, if your interest was impaired because it was either not deductible at all, because you bought after October 21, or if it was 50% deductible, you will have made one of these mythical tax profits, even though you might have been cash flow neutral or negative, but in the 25 year, in the 26 year, that profit will reduce or disappear. So just watch that if you happen to have a, a larger tax liability in 24 because of the impact that interest limitation rules are having on you, then that will cascade into a higher provisional tax obligation for you in the 25 year, which you could avoid by estimating and paying less, but you've got to be careful about that because it can expose you to use of money interest. So the, the moral of the story is talk to your accountant there about paying provisional tax in the 2025 year if you have been severely impacted by interest limitation rules. And it may be that your property may start to run at a tax loss or your portfolio may start to run at a tax loss. Unfortunately, the ring fencing rules, which were brought in now around four or five years ago, it's hard for me to remember. There's so many changes that have happened over the, the last five years. Hard to remember when they all uh, came into effect or changed or in this case got repealed. But anyway, the ring fencing rules came in around four or five years ago and they are still in place. So while you get interest deductions restored, which is excellent news, you can't offset any losses that get produced as a result of that against any income other than rental property related income. Can't be offset against salary. Those, those days would appear to be long gone and probably not coming back, although I'd never say never, but certainly no, no um, relief there in the immediate term. And you might ask, well, what about the interest that I have been prevented from claiming the um, outcome of that is, unfortunately, that's not released. That, that might have been the most optimistic sort of rose-tinted view is that the government might have not only restored interest deductions, but said, well, we'll give you back the ones that you were prevented from claiming. That's not going to happen. Uh, but if you do happen to have a rental property that you end up selling for a taxable gain because it's been sold within its bright line period, which, of course, 
the odds on that will reduce now that that's dropping to two years or if the property is tainted, for example. If there is a future gain on uh, sale, then any interest deductions that you haven't been able to claim in the year to 31 March 23, 31 March 24 can be used to reduce your taxable profit. But if you hold on to your rental property long enough so that when you sell it, there is no tax to pay on any gain realized, then the interest uh, deductions that you have been prevented from claiming uh, just slip into a black hole and, and disappear. Um, they won't be able to be offset against uh, any other income, unfortunately. Well, you know, there's been so much spin on this, Anthony. Um, I was at dinner on Saturday night and uh, somebody asked me, they said, oh, what, what's, what's the story with the retrospective interest deductibility that landlords are getting as a backhander from this government? Hmm. You know, and, and that was talking to uh, bringing the rules in halfway through the financial year and the perspective of uh, perhaps in the last half of the financial year, um, you know, that, that's already transacted that, that you might be able to pick it up if they brought it in with effect from the beginning of the financial year. You might have picked up that, you know, the first half of the financial year, but it was being spun in the media as handouts for landlords. It was it was such a spin. It was such a negative spin. I couldn't believe it. You know, they were sort of implying that it was going to go back to the beginning, beginning of time. And, yeah. um, you know, I thought that was revolting. Yeah, yeah. A lot of that around, yeah. Uh, rollover relief. Let's talk about that. Now, this is, is relevant because I think what we're going to find is that there's going to be a lot more uh, scope and potential benefit in restructuring ownership of uh, rental properties. When the Brightline rule, uh, Brightline period, I should say, was increased to five years and when the interest limitation rules were brought in, it really put uh, quite a place, quite a barrier in the way of carrying out restructures. There were, there were still um, benefit from an asset protection perspective, from an estate planning perspective and moving uh, assets into trust ownership. But a lot of the tax benefit of restructuring had been removed and there was a lot of potential downside. But now that the bright line period is reduced to two years and now that interest deductions are being restored, there's a lot more scope for carrying out a restructure. And I'll give you an example of that, hopefully a relatively simple one. Let's say that I am on the verge of buying a new home and I want to keep my current home as a rental. <clears throat> I'm going to be borrowing money to buy the new home. And I would dearly like for the interest on that to be deductible against the rent that I'm going to be getting off my old home. But the only way I can achieve that is if I restructure the ownership of my old home by selling it into a rental trust or a rental company. Now, when the interest limitation rules were around, there was no benefit for me in doing that because I wouldn't be able to get a deduction for the interest unless I was going to rent it out as social housing if my home was not a new build. So there was no point restructuring ownership of my home because I was never going to get a deduction for the interest. But now... I could sell my home to a rental company. I can direct borrowing that I'm undertaking to buy the new home into the rental company. The rental company pays me for buying the rental off me and I use the money to buy the new home. So it's classic, uh, what we call a debt restructure uh, to get deductibility of interest on borrowing that otherwise would not be deductible. So now, when you I do just, I that, just updated that slide for you, Anthony. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So when you, when you do that, it's all well and good for me to sit here and say there's a benefit for you in restructuring your old home into a rental company or into a rental trust because you'll get a greater amount of your interest deductible. All good and well for me to say that, but you'll want to know, are there any negative consequences of doing this? Because in particular you'll be concerned about the bright line rule. Now, in my example, if the property was my home 
me selling it to my rental trust or company is not going to be caught by Brightline because there's the main home exemption. But if it were, say, a rental property that I was looking to restructure and I'd only owned it for a year, then moving it into a trust or a company will trigger Brightline unless I get rollover relief. And when the new Brightline rules came in to reduce the period to two years, commentary that accompanied those rules said that we're going to keep, where's the effect of, we're going to not only keep the rollover relief rules as exist at the moment, but we're going to make them easier. We're going to extend them, make them broader. But unfortunately, it's it's sort of like a McDonald's ad where you see the um, the the burger on TV and then you go to the store and you unwrap the burger and there's a massive discrepancy between um, the marketing visuals and the um, the uh, digestibility of the reality. And so in this case, the reality doesn't match the marketing. The new rollover relief rules are not more permissive than the old ones. Basically, it means that if you move a property into a company for a start, you are not going to get um, rollover relief. There's going to be a reset of the two-year bright line period because you can only get rollover relief if a series of conditions are satisfied. And here are those conditions. Number one, you need to be transferring the property to an associated entity that must have existed for two years. So you can't set up a rental company and even though it's associated to you and transfer a property into it and get rollover relief because that association hasn't existed for two years if the rental company didn't exist for two years. As a sideline, there's a bit more ability to do that with the trust because they look through the trust to the beneficiaries and as long as you've been associated to the beneficiaries for two years that criteria will be satisfied so a bit more scope moving property into a trust but pretty hard to get rollover relief moving into a company but that's still not even enough to get you across the line because not only do you need to meet that association test for a two-year period prior to making the transfer but you only get rollover relief if you've owned the property for less than two years. So if I've bought a rental a year ago, I can transfer that to a rental company as long as that company existed two years ago, or I can transfer it to a trust as long as I was associated to the beneficiaries of that trust for more than two years. That's on a rental property I've owned for one year. I can move it in and no consequences for me, even though I'm moving it within the bright line period because I get rollover relief. No consequences for the new owner. It doesn't get a reset of the clock. It's got one year to go. But if I've owned that property for three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, and I transfer it to a trust or I transfer it to a company, there will be a reset of the bright line clock. I don't get rollover relief. On the it's one hand, counterintuitive, isn't it? Because yeah, the older yeah. The longer you should get rollover relief, you should be able to move it around between related parties, but they're doing the opposite. Exactly. They're saying, they're saying if you've owned it a short time, uh, then you know, you're allowed, you're allowed to get rollover relief. So yeah, if you've owned it for a short period of time, how about this? We'll we'll hardly add any extra time. In fact, if you own it for a short period of time, we won't add any extra time so that you can sell it within two years. But if you've owned it for 15 years or 17 years or 20 years or 25 years, we're going to add another two years regardless. So you could end up with a taxable sale after 26 years of ownership. Yeah. So uh, not better, worse. A few yeah. questions here. Um, we had a sale and purchase agreement in November last year. It was a private sale and we still haven't settled. If we settle it on or after 1 July, uh, shall we have, or do we have a two-year bright line or a 10-year bright line? Well, I don't know if you've got a 10-year, but you certainly don't have a two-year. So I can't tell you what your bright line period was because I don't know when you bought it. But I can tell you now that if you entered into the agreement in November, it doesn't matter if you settle after 1 July, you're not going to get the benefit of the new two-year rule. Yeah, I think it would be useful if you um, cancelled your agreement and re-contracted with them on 1 July. Yeah. So if you can't get out and re-contract, that would be useful. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, Dave says, what changed national government investors expected from the announcements in December 
that the interest relief deductions would apply to the 2024 year when it remained the same, Dave. Did you understand that? I'm not sure. I I I think I think I were talking about the that retrospective um, interest. Yeah, which didn't didn't come to pass. So 24 yeah. year was just status quo. Liam Gilbert says, can we offset losses against profits in a trading entity if we're both part of a wholly owned group, i.e. the same shareholder structure? So I presume you're saying, Liam, residential losses from a residential long-term investment portfolio, and you're wanting to offset those with losses from a revenue account property trading activity. So capital losses with revenue profits. Yeah, property trading profit. So that that's a very good question. And I think in the context of a wholly owned group, it can be done. Um, so we're talking about the ring fencing rules there. So is it possible for a residential ring fenced loss to be offset against um, property trading profit? And um, from memory, there was, uh, it's a point that I would need to check to be perfectly honest. But yeah, from I'd, memory, be, I'd be careful on that. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Liam will take the fifth email us. You've got our email. Yeah. We just need to check that. Uh Jocelyn asks Remat's restructure example. Is it okay to restructure an existing rent, residential rental and trust with no loan to to another say trust and have max lending and start claiming interest? It was the it was first rented with interest when interest was disallowed. Yes, Jocelyn. Yes, is the answer. That's exactly what we're talking about here. And IRD, many years ago, provided an example of a property and an individual's name being sold to an LTC, and the debt was was increased substantially in the example, let's say from 0 to 100%, and they said that that was not tax avoidance. So it's analogous to what you're saying there. So yes is the answer. That should, that should please you. Um, uh... That's it. Keep going, Libby. I think we're getting through. Yes, uh, trust tax rate changes. So we're now in the uh, the thirty nine percent environment. So from the first of April, the trust tax rate increased to thirty nine percent, so that aligns with the top personal rate. Uh, there's one. Uh, uh, there was a piece of late breaking news, although it's not of a huge amount of significance, but if you have a trust with less than $10,000 of taxable income, then that's what we call a de minimis trust. And that uh, is still able to pay tax at 33%. But for all other trusts, the tax rate has now increased to 39% from the 2025 financial year, which is 1 April 2024 for most of us. So everybody's been paying dividends out by 30 of March 2024. Yeah, I'd like to do it now, but certainly there was the opportunity to clear clear your dividends out. If your accountants didn't push that, they um, probably haven't helped you. And so, what does this mean? Um, well, it, it's pretty straightforward. It means that you you've got more tax to pay if you've got trust income, and if you've got, for example, a trust earning uh, dividend income in the past. There would be 5% top up on that dividend income, given the company rates 28%. Now there's going to be 11% top up. And we've got a uh, next slide, I think it is, Matt, an example of, oh, well, okay, we'll get to the example in a second. So how do trusts pay tax? Either the income is retained in the trust, or at least it's recorded as being retained in the trust, and therefore the trust tax rate applies, or you can allocate to beneficiaries. And if you allocate income to beneficiaries, then it's the rate of the beneficiary that applies. So there can be scope to um, sidestep the 39% rate by making allocations to uh, beneficiaries who are subject to lower rates. So here's an example that illustrates the impact of the trust tax rate going to 39% uh, for a trust that is in the fortunate position of owning shares in a company that is able to pay a million dollar dividend. So this example, up until 31 March 2024, if the trust receives a million dollar dividend, there's already been 28% company tax paid on that. A further 5% tax is paid to 
breach the trust tax rate of 33% as applicable. And that then leaves net dividend of $670,000. Now, from 1 April 2024, same dividend, you end up with 11% um, additional tax to pay on top of the company tax paid, and therefore an additional 6% or $60,000 on a million dollars of dividend income. How could you get a better outcome than paying an additional $60,000 of tax? If you have beneficiaries who are age 16 or older and who have little or no other income, then you can distribute income to them. So in this example, we've got three beneficiaries. So that's a spouse and two teenage children that are earning, we'll assume, nothing. And we distribute $70,000 of beneficiary income to them. Then that reduces the effective tax rate on the dividend that was 39% down to 35%. And there's a, a tax saving of around $13,000. And I've just realized, Matt, that that $13,000 will be, I don't know, $13,100 after the government's much trumpeted um, tax bracket changes to oh, come into effect as well. Because so, yeah. so this this dividend is based on the tax rates as we sit here right now from 31 July, um, as everyone I imagine will be acutely aware of the um, lower tax brackets, the 10.5 and the 17.5% tax brackets are shifting upwards, which means that there's going to be a, a little bit more benefit in allocating um, income out of trusts to beneficiaries who have little or no other income as there'd be more scope for income to be taxed at those lower rates. Okay. A few questions coming in here, but I'll, I'll, wait to, I'll let you finish the... Yeah, well, yeah, this is a good question, given that, that I've just said you could allocate, uh, for example, $70,000 to your 16 and your 17-year-old. Can they then uh, knock on your bedroom door uh, while you're getting ready for work and say, well, thanks, I'd like my money now? Uh, yes, it, it's real. So when you allocate beneficiary income uh, to a beneficiary, that's a, a real obligation on behalf of the trust to apply that money towards their benefit. That doesn't mean given their money so they can jump on a plane and, and go skiing in Japan. Uh, it could mean that the trust offsets what's owed against paying um, school fees, private school fees, university fees. Uh, maybe it could be provided to them as a deposit on a first house. So there's, there's ways to offset the balance that will be owed to the children. But I think the main thing to take out of that is that you can't, sort of flippantly allocate beneficiary income uh, to beneficiaries and think that it's inconsequential. So for example, you can't start to allocate to your parents or your grandparents and then have them gift the money back to you. Um, that's that's uh, tantamount to avoidance, I would imagine, in the view of the IRD. Or you could just let the, the balance sit there owing, uh, which eventually then um, could be paid out after you've passed on. But in the meantime, it is, again, an asset that's owed to them, which is at, at risk of being called up. Uh, there's quite a <clears throat> classical question here. Um, purchase a property December 22 with one house on it. <clears throat> a redevelopment into four houses in total. Is that any? Does that have any effect uh, with Brightline if I sell it for 1 July 2024? This is a revenue account property, Anthony. Okay, well, well. so firstly, Matt, of course, when you say it's a revenue account property for the listeners, if it were a revenue account, that would mean it, it would be taxable um, under provisions other than Brightline. But let's let's deal with Brightline. Yeah, I think in defense of this, I shouldn't make that assumption. Uh, yeah. The purchase property, a purchase property in December 2022, says Alex with one house on it and redeveloped it into four houses in total. So if you were developed to hold that's non-taxable, you've got a 10-year bright line rule because you bought it in December 2022 when the when the so date of acquisition gives you a 10-year bright line rule. And then if you sell it uh, after 1 July 2024, 
then uh, you've got a two-year bright line rule in theory. Um, yep, yep. You got a two two-year bright line rule, so it means you, of course, can't sell it before December twenty twenty-four. So even reducing to two years, your bright yeah. line period still hasn't finished come one July. So yes. if you sell it between July and December twenty-four, you will be caught by bright line. But if you sell after December 2024, once two years have passed since settlement of the original undivided property, and this may be what Alex is getting at as well, a question that, as you know, Matt, that we get all of the time is, does the bright line period reset when I do a subdivision and I get new titles or when I build a new house, does the bright line period reset? Answer, no, it does not. The bright line period runs from the day that you settle the original undivided piece of land. Doing a subdivision and getting new titles does not reset Brightline. Building a new dwelling, getting CCC does not reset Brightline. And so the answer would be different, Alex, if you bought that property with the intention of resale. Absolutely. That would be revenue account. You would be claiming GST if that was the case. Uh, four houses, mm, yep, because you're, you're building and selling. And so Brightline doesn't apply, it would be normal income tax. Um, so Marcus um, asks a really good question here, Anthony, uh, and this is a question on point for many people. <clears throat> he says, is there a way for investors who set up LTCs prior to the introduction of ring-fenced losses to, to transfer their property into a standard company? Or I guess another way of saying that, Marcus, is, is there a way to convert your LTC to be an ordinary company? Because uh, no doubt Marcus has an income uh, a high income, he's exposed to the 39% tax bracket. The income is now flowing through the LTC to him. He would like to trap that at 28% in an ordinary company and not, not be LTC. So that is a real classic restructure question being asked, and it comes back to those rollover relief rules and the new bottom rule. And Anthony, I'll hand that to you. Yeah, well, I, I think you've nailed it, Matt. The, the question is not so much can you transfer the property to a company, but can you transition the company from being an LTC to an ordinary company? And you can do that. You can revoke LTC status. Um, it is a deemed disposal when you do that. It's a deemed disposal of the property. Uh, so there will be, in my opinion, a reset of the bright line period, um, assuming that you didn't buy the property within the last two years. Yeah, and then uh, if there is a deemed disposal, is it currently subject to bright line or is it tainted? Uh, and if it is, then you could be taxable. Yeah, well, you have to check. Yeah, fair, fair point. There, there need to, because it is a deemed disposal, then care would need to be taken to ensure that none of the properties in that company are within the current, within the bright line period presently, that none of them are tainted, that none of them are subject to any of the other land tax provisions. But if you yeah. cover all of that off, then revoking uh, could be a, a, a course of action to take to uh, get the ability to take advantage of the company tax rate of 28%. And I guess a question that might be asked is, is that tax avoidance? I have a view, I have a view on that, but what's your view? Uh, yeah, what my view is that it's not that? tax... My, my view would be that it's not tax avoidance. I don't think revoking LTC status... Um, would be tax tax avoidance, I think. Part, part. I, and I would agree, and I would say because it's Parliament's intent, they give you the ability to elect and unelect. <clears throat> They're very clear about the consequences of it, so it's Parliament's intent. Yep. You do get the odd tax collector out there that likes to say everything's tax avoidance, and that they're often not correct. Uh, Lance says, if I bought a property uh, built three years ago under the five-year Brightline test and rent it out, uh, does this bright line test start again? So I presume you're living in it, Lance, and then you've rented it out um, after three years. So your question is, do you reset the bright line period by renting it out? And the answer is no. No. Because your bright line clock starts at the date of acquisition, and that was three years ago. Renting it out is of no consequence. Uh, Jane says, hello, Anthony. So if a, if a property transaction on the 31st of March 2024, if there's a property transaction on the 31st of March 2024, what is the bright line for this property? 10 years or two years? 
So it was bought in 31 March 2024. Yeah, so date of acquisition is 31 March 2024. Right, right. Okay. Well, right now, as we're sitting here talking, the bright line period is 10 years. Uh, if you ask me the question again in 20, 21 days' time, the bright line period is two years. The bright line property for all property shifts to two years from 1 July. And I think the confusion comes uh, that it used to be the date of acquisition that was critical because that set the bright line period. But now with the national government's new, the coalition government's new rules, it's date of sale. All sales after 1 July 2024 get a two-year bright line period. That's what Anthony said earlier. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's a, good, a good way to good way to articulate it. Yeah. Um, Jenny says with rollover relief rules, we're purchasing this month a property for our future home, but renting it at present until we sell our current home. Potential period one year. How how will these rules apply? Okay, so there's a suggestion there that the headings up and get association, don't they, for the period? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I would say, why would you want to rely on the rollover relief rules if you know that it's going to be your home? Then I'd, I'd, from, from my first thought would be buy the property in a structure that's appropriate for the long term use of the property as a home. Then you it don't just, need to it move just it anywhere. Totally gets tricky though, there, doesn't it? Because it, it yeah, really yeah, that longer they get pulled out. So, mm. so you can answer that both ways. But um, Jenny, my feeling there is you, you'd want to think well, where, and probably this is what Anthony was about to say to you. Um, you you'd want to think well, where do I want the rental property to be, and where do I want the uh, family home to be? And then think about how you can manipulate the debt so that when you move out of the existing property into the new one, um, are you going to sell your current home? Mm. You just need to think about how you're going to manipulate the debt so that on sale of your current home, you can move the debt to the rental property. And you can do that by selling it to an entity and calling the loan later and refinancing the debt into it. So we can we can help you with that. Um, I read the property's under a trust, trading at a loss. Can this loss be used to offset beneficiaries' PAYE obligations? No, no. Um, a residential rental loss is ring fenced. In any event, doesn't it's agnostic on what the structure is. So if it's in a trust, a partnership, a company. Residential rental losses are loss ring fenced in New Zealand. And secondly, losses are locked in a trust. You can't allocate losses to a beneficiary to offset PAYE. So, no, sorry, Catherine. Right, oh, um, we're getting through it. So, in summary, Anthony. Yes, yeah, so in summary, on the trust tax rate issue, it, it obviously is not great news, particularly if you have. A company, um, sorry, if you have a trust that owns shares in a, in a profitable company that's going to be uh, pumping out dividends. So what you could do is you could not declare dividends. You can keep money, profit in the company and pay tax at 28%. It doesn't avoid the need to pay the extra 11, but it defers it. But how long can you do that for? Because ultimately you do want to get your hands on the cash. And so that raises the question, if you've got a company that's making money and you don't want to declare dividends, how can you get your hands on the money? You can't just pull it out. If you pull money out of a company, pull profit out, that and, and the company doesn't owe you money, then that creates what we call an overdrawn current account. I think it's on the next slide, Matt, that we've got an example where if you have an overdrawn current account, so the trust pulls out $720,000 of net profit without declaring a dividend, without repaying loan balance, then that triggers a deemed interest income in the company because if the company does not return interest on that loan, 
then there's a deemed dividend to the trust and tax to pay on that. So we end up with quite a significant tax cost in this example. Yeah. But what you could do is if you are, say, a property trader, you may well also be a property investor. And we like the idea of a wholly owned group because we have a wholly owned group. You can take your property trading profit, which you will pay tax on, right? You pay tax at 28% on your property trading profit. But rather than drawing that out as an overdrawn current account to the trust, you could use that in the rental activity. And if you make loans from company to company with a wholly owned group, there is no dividend. So you can use the money productively after only paying 28% tax. Again, it doesn't, def it doesn't permanently dodge the, the fact that there will be a dividend and likely additional 11% to pay. But in the meantime, you can compound that 11% saving by pushing it across from trading company to investment company. And so when we say property trading company there, that could be a business. It doesn't have to be property trading. You might have a profitable business, manufacturing, retail, trade, whatever. You've got a profitable business and you're an investor. You could make profit in your company at pay tax at 28% and then loan it across to another company with identical shareholding that forms what we call a wholly owned group. And I think that's pretty close to, oh, so there we go. There's the, the loan from the trading company to the rental company, which uses it to pay down rental debt. So we use our I mean, that's a hell of a that's a hell of an advantage because you're getting compound interest on that eleven percent. So that on the tax deferral, you save eleven percent in the first year, then the second year, then the third year. So it's compounding, and then every year you roll another eleven percent in compounding. It's a significant saving. So. That structure's great. I, you're probably bored at this time of night thinking, what does all this mean? Well, if you're self-employed uh, or if you're Liam listening, you know, that is what you do with your money. That was Liam's structure he was asking about before. Um, so, yeah, I think um, in summary, if uh, if you have the opportunity to uh, make beneficiary distributions to kids who are 16 or older or to spouses, um, that's something that can get around this new trust tax rate of 39%. Uh, you can use wholly owned groups, as we just showed you, to mitigate your your tax down to 28%. And you can still pay your spouse's market value salaries. Uh, make sure you're doing that. If you're not remunerating your spouse and they're working in your businesses, then you may well be giving up uh, you know, the, the obvious opportunity to be able to use their marginal tax rates and average down your overall income. Um, Anthony, as always, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, amazing. We've got so many no questions. Worries. Yeah, we've got so many questions here uh, on tax structures, things like, you know, are LTCs the right structure to use? Have LTCs gone out of vogue? Um, you know, what structure should you be using? Now, our website, GRA, has other webinars on specifically those topics. What is the best tax structure? So go there, front page of it is Anthony and I running a webinar. We did it sort of September last year. It's on point for, for this presentation tonight. You know, what is the best tax and legal structure? And we go through trusts and companies and debt structures and, and you know, the types of things that we're doing with Chris Peterson mortgages where we not only think about the tax deductibility of things, you know, maybe we want to move the debt over a business where, where it's not loss ring fenced. Maybe we want to move the debt over commercial property where it's not loss ring fenced. Maybe you want to gear your uh, your uh, share portfolio, you know, borrow money against your share portfolio, pay debt down on your rental property because your rental properties are loss ring fenced. If you borrow money against your share portfolio, you can actually use the tax losses and, and then they're not loss ring fenced. So these sorts of tax planning ideas that uh, involve debt and the repurposing of debt to uh, to get better tax outcomes are the sorts of things that we give advice on. We work very closely with Chris Peterson Mortgages. And as Chris was saying before, uh, you you can get the banks to give you cash back when you're restructuring uh, for, you know, for asset protection and for better interest deductibility. So a lot of that is discussed on our website at GRA. 
get on the front page, go through the various blogs and, and look at some of the other webinars. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for coming along and giving us that update. We really appreciate that. And Anthony, once again, and uh, mm -hmm. to our listeners, thanks very much. Appreciate you hanging in there and listening to the presentation. Um, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks and good night. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.